Good evening. Welcome to the Long Beach Community College Board of Trustees meeting um, for September 12th. Uh, we are um, going to start um, as soon as Trustee Intuk takes his seat and um, Trustee Otto. Um, Vice President Malaulu, can you lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance? Would everyone please stand? Join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice President Malaulu. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Item 2.3. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Walk Joe Intuck. Present. Doug Otto. Here. And Sunny Zia. Here. Student Trustee Jones. Here. Item 2.4, report on closed session items. We have no report out. Item 2.5, am I going too fast, Madam Secretary? Slow me down if you need me to. So, Slow it down. Um, item 2.5, approval of minutes of the August 21st, 2018 regular Board of Trustees meeting. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Madam, Madam, Madam Secretary, um, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah. Trustee Antuk? Uh, I was just wanted to, you know, I, I read through the minutes to look accurate. One of the things of, of process improvement, I know that we record these videos on YouTube and they create hyperlinks. Would it be possible in future minutes to include the hyperlinks in the minutes? So if someone wanted to quickly connect to the video, that was possible? Then when we used to be on the personnel commission, we had our audio embedded into our minutes that made it real oh. easy for people to listen. I think anything we could do to make it more accessible to the public would be fabulous, and I would support that. What about the rest of the board? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you for the great suggestion, Jesse and Took. All right, we're going, going to move on to item, uh, excuse me, we didn't do the row uh, call vote. Virginia Baxter. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udawak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Jones. Abstain. Item 2.6, superintendent president's report. Thank you, welcome everyone tonight. Please do, before you leave, pick up a beautiful copy of our new newsletter headed by Josh Castellanos and his entire team in the marketing department who've brought this exciting news to you. Um, the second item, I'm very excited. You're going to be really thrilled when you hear this. Um, we're going to hear a report tonight from our foundation, and they're going to talk to us about the exciting activities that are going on there, so we want to welcome the foundation and all of the Board of Governors in the audience. Um, what's even more exciting than that is just a couple weeks ago, I received a very large check. That check was in the amount of $441,000, $914.93. Does that get you excited? That's, <laughs> it's truly incredible. And that is what they give us, what our donors give us for the Long Beach College Promise. So please, before you leave today, do take a moment to thank the foundation for their hard work and for these donations, because those donations truly change lives. Um, with regard to where do we go from here on the promise, we are in some discussions as to where do we take it next now that we have the new promise money from the state. More news to come on that. but. Promise 2.0, which is a dual admission program into Cal State Long Beach and Long Beach City College, is about to be announced publicly. It's going to be announced publicly at an event on September 26th here on campus, and this is a game changer. This is truly bringing access and cutting down those barriers that exist between community colleges and universities. This is once again taking our existing college promise, which is a national model, and moving it to another national model. And so um, as people all over the nation look to Long Beach for where do we go next with the promise, we're going to tell them exactly where to go, and that's some dual admission, which means that Cal State Long Beach um, has approximately 100,000 applicants each year. 
and they only take about eight or 10,000 students. So what happens to those other 90? If you get admitted, or if you, you can be admitted to Long Beach City College on a dual curricular pathway with Long Beach State, everybody's favorite school, our hometown school, providing you keep your GPA at a certain GPA, you can transfer in your junior year with an AA degree in hand. And you're going to have a Cal State Long Beach ID the entire time. So you can go to the football games, and you can go to the library. So it's really going to be a barrier breaker. Um, and at Monday's Heart Port, Port of Long Beach Harbor Commission meeting, something groundbreaking happened. You know that the, that the Long Beach College Promise has four partners, the city of Long Beach, Long Beach City College, Long Beach Unified, and Cal State Long Beach. Well, guess what? The Port of Long Beach has signed on to be the very first industry partner to the College Promise. This is going to set a national benchmark. We're going to work with them on partnerships, curricular development that leads to jobs at the port. So this is, once again, Long Beach leading the way. So what a wonderful history um, that we can celebrate. I want to thank and congratulate Dr. Mike Munoz, our Vice President of Student Services, who was selected to receive the Dr. Cynthia Johnson Award for Contributions in Higher Education through Exceptional Student Mentoring. Congratulations. And thank you to everyone for getting a little funky on College Day. We had a lot of fun, and it turns out we have started a competition uh, there are other colleges, including Cal State Fullerton and Glendale, that have gotten on our wagon of creating fun videos that create enthusiasm and excitement for learning. So thank you for everyone for helping with a very successful event. Um, we've hosted um, the superintendent, uh, Dr. Mary Sue from the ABC District, and Dr. Crosswaite from the Linwood Unified School District, who are very interested in finding out about opportunities and options for their students here at Long Beach City College. And we want to congratulate our own trustee, Entuck, who's going to be a speaker at the upcoming North Long Beach Teen Summit. That's on September 22nd. It's a Saturday from 12 to 4 at the Michelle Obama Library. Please do go see that. I also want to thank our counselors, especially Dwayne Schaefer and Lorraine Bloon and Noel Corral and all of our counselors for bringing forward an idea for a welcome center. We did the ribbon cutting on two of our welcome centers, one on each campus this week. And it's, it's been a tremendous success. Um, we have a very special presentation uh, tonight on, to honor our LGBTQ History Month. Um, the trustees last month requested an update to our travel policy. You're going to see that at tonight's meeting. And as well as a new facilities committee. So looking forward to keeping fulfilling these excellent requests and great ideas. So congratulations, everyone, with a special thank you. Please thank them when you do leave the foundation for that unbelievable generosity that they've shown. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. As usual, great report, and thank you for your leadership. Um, item 2.7, ASB uh, President's Report. Hi. Hi, good evening, Welcome. everyone. Good evening. So. For my report, um, Jackie Hein is uh, going to give you some documents. So in that document, I just want to update from my predecessor, Javier Salcedo, Salcedo um, our changes to our orga organizational chart. Um, that, uh, what you have in the first page is the old organizational chart last year, and the second page is the new organizational chart for this school year. The goal of the previous cabinet was to approve the new organizational chart to remove the division between LAC and PCC campus, as we believe we don't represent LAC or PCC campus, but we believe that we represent Long Beach City College. And in order to move some of the representatives of the PCC council up in the same voting power as the ASB cab members. Also, we wanted the ASB cab members to concentrate in advocacy and legislation and move the responsibility of making events to our new programming board, which we're going to call the Viking Activities Council. Um, with the new changes applied this school year, we are still in the prog process of completing the ASB cabinet members. So right now, we are expecting to have 21 cabinet members, but right now, we're still incomplete. The ASB will have a complete board by September 17, and I will introduce um, the new cabinet members and the programming board members in the next board of trustees, board of trustees meeting. 
So for past events, the ASVCAP members had a training last August 14th, wherein we had, the, we had to meet the staff uh, and members of student life, and we had the opportunity to have Dr. Mike Munoz talk about how, how can he uh, offer his services to the ASVCAP members. Um, the ASVCAP members had, the AS, uh, had a retreat last August 28th to the 22nd with the theme of rising together with the goal of advocacy uh, legislation and inter interconnectedness with my fellow students, faculty, staff, directors, deans, vice president, uh, President Mali, and the board of trustees. So, with that said, I took the initiative to uh, to have to collect all the district committees on campus so that we can have um, our students' voices on those district committees. So, I just want to uh, sh a quick shout out. I don't know if she's here, but uh, shout out to Jennifer Holmgram to helping me uh, create all these district committees. And you know, it's really exciting to have the opportunity to voice uh, uh, my opinion as a student. And how can we make the campus better? Um, also, on August 24th, I had the opportunity to speak on College Day. I want to thank Dr. Kathleen Scott for giving giving me the opportunity. Um, it was cool for me to like. Um, share my story, uh, where I started, and where I am right now. So, um, Dr. Scott, if you have more speaking opportunities, please let me know. <laughs> so, for the incoming events for, um, uh, for ASB, we're going to have the LAC Join the Club Day tomorrow. So, if you guys are not too busy with your schedules, please uh, visit us tomorrow from 10 a.m. to uh, 2 p.m. Also, on September 17th, we will celebrate the Constitution Day and we will be giving out the Constitution books from 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. On September 26th, we will have the Healthy Viking Initiative Nutrition Day 1 on September 26th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And also, uh, for the, the big responsibilities that we're going to do is the Associated Student Body members will be attending the California Community College Student Affairs Association, a three-day student leadership conference from October 19th to the 21st at Sheridan Gateway Los Angeles Hotel. The, the Seesaw is a student leadership development and training conference which focuses on building individual student leadership and technical skills and pro professional collaborative connections. This will be a great opportunity for us to um, see what other community colleges are doing on their campuses and what, what, what can we uh, uh, improve or like what what they can uh, get from us also and also since this year is uh, my the eight, uh, associate student body this year is goal is to have uh, advocacy we will also be attending the student senate for california community colleges general assembly from october 26 to 28 at the otaria convention center and on the next board of choice meaning all the information that we gathered uh, I will create a PowerPoint and see like um, what we what we are what, what where are we right now and how does the community colleges uh, do their some of the things that they're doing and you know we can incorporate here also let's end of my report thank you thank you Pablo I have to tell you as a, a proud Iranian American and an immigrant I'm so proud of you uh, for those of you who don't know, Pablo is a first-generation immigrant who's only been in the States for three years, correct? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and look at him. He's our pride and joy, and I really am proud of you. I know I can uh, speak for the rest of us. We're very proud of you and your accomplishments, and know you're going to go to places. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Item 2.8, student trustee, another one of our... <laughs> amazing pride and joys, uh, Donnell, if you can... Please give a report. Sure. Thank you. Um, first off, um, I would like to thank everybody here for dedicating your time this evening to uh, civic engagement and being involved in showing up, um, especially with all the hustle and bustle of the new semester going on. Uh, I'd like to report that the month of August, well, first I'd like to apologize for the, my absence for the, uh, the meetings from the month of August. Um, August was really a month marked by uh, lots of trainings, retreats, and workshops um, on, with actually one occurring nearly every week um, throughout the month of uh, August. Um, with that said, I do, I must admit that I feel slightly more equipped to better represent and advocate for 
uh, our community and our students here. Um, moving down to, I, I apologize. <coughs> This is my first official report, guys. Bear with me. You're doing great. <laughs> um, to kind of give more detail for the month of August, uh, I had the opportunity to attend the A to Mend workshop. A to Mend is an organization that is dedicated to um, rec uh, helping our most impacted and uh, underachieving or underperforming students succeed through community and mentorship. Um, and we are excited to possibly establish a charter here on this campus um, for our students. Also, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, student trustee workshop on August 8th, the 10th through the 12th, sorry, on August the 10th through the 12th, um, where I was able to network with a lot of the other uh, student leaders and student representatives from California, uh, representing the California Community Colleges. And then also on August 20th through the 22nd, I had the opportunity to uh, go to a workshop with our student leaders here from Long Beach City College uh, to better uh, prepare ourselves for the role of advocacy this semester for our students. Also, I would also like to report that um, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with several students, staff, and faculty members to find ways that we as students can help our, our, our brothers and sisters here achieve, persist, and succeed on to the next level. Um, to continue on what uh, our president said earlier, our associate and student body leaders have been working very hard these past three weeks to prepare for the semester um, on the 10th this past Monday, we just approved um, some new student representatives and advocates. And then on the 17th, we will be confirming new student leaders, uh, the rest of the student leaders um, on that day from three to five. You guys are more than welcome to join us there. We will be located here in the T1100. Um, and then in closing, I would like to congratulate Dr. Munoz on your award and to congratulate uh, st our superintendent president for her contract being renewed. Thank you. That's fantastic. Great work. Uh, see, wasn't that difficult? You're wonderful. Uh, item 2.9, LBCCFA bargaining president, uh, Janae Hund. Uh, just for the, um, uh, as a point of information, um, we have removed uh, limitations on uh, time for uh, your uh, comments and report and all the other um, constituent groups. So take your time. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Zia, board members, um, President uh, Ramali, Vice Presidents, faculty, staff, students, and community members, and a special shout out to our eight new full-time faculty sitting in our close to front row. So uh, the semester is off to a good start after an amazing college day. I heard longtime colleagues state that they had never experienced a college day like this one before, and it was the best one ever. So let's see what next year is going to look like. No pressure. Uh, as student success was a theme for the day, I just want to remind uh, everyone that FA, LBCCFA, is a partner in the effort to increase student success and completions. And again, I want to show appreciation to the board for extending Dr. Amali's contract for another four years. She is a fearless leader for student success, and she is paving the way for our constituent groups to best serve our students. I missed the last meeting, but I do want to thank the board for moving up the constituents report to this point in the meeting. Uh, as internal stakeholders, we appreciate a place on the agenda to provide insights to the board prior to discussing and passing agenda items. For example, I look forward to hearing tonight during the budget presentation about the 2017-18 ending balance in reserves, including the reserve, per reserve percentage. 
Additionally, I would like to hear what the district anticipates to be the reserves ending balance and percentage for the end of 2018-19. I do want to thank the district for creating a behavioral intervention team based on best practices for campus safety. And this team includes our licensed mental health clinician, Amy Law. LBCCFA, uh, though, is still looking for the district to implement existing campus policies that include consultation with Long Beach City College's licensed, clinic, licensed clinicians when faculty and staff report actionable threats as well as existing policies surrounding campus safety in a timely manner with a transparent communication process. On that note, I want to read a statement by English faculty Catherine McMurray who asked me to share this with you. This is longer than my portion, so bear with me. First, I am so grateful for the support of my colleagues, Velvet Pearson, Kirsten Moreno, and Jennifer Carrot, and for the kindness and care provided by Officer Chi and Lieutenant Omar Martinez of Campus Safety. As an instructor of college students for now 14 years, I have gathered much experience in the classroom and have attended many professional development activities, both here at Long Beach City College and at conferences, training sessions, and workshops off campus. I care deeply about the quality of the instruction that I provide to students in the classroom. I care about the health and safety of my students as well. That is why it was shocking to me to have some of my first encounters with the Office of Student Discipline and Conduct here at Long Beach City College. In working with the faculty work group on campus safety, I know that my experience is not isolated. It has been frustrating to approach student discipline and conduct about conduct issues with a student in the classroom to the point that I, at times, would rather not reach out for help at all. Typically, I contact my department head first if the issue persists, I then reach out to the division dean. However, that's not always been an efficient way of resolving issues with students who escalate their misconduct quickly. For example, students who yell at instructors, throw items in the classroom, slam doors, shove desks, or insult or threaten faculty. In those instances, I have reached out to student discipline, my department head, and division dean at the same time because the situation requires an expeditious response. Despite filling out correct forms and carefully navigating communication with students, with such students, when I finally discussed the situation with student discipline, I was always met with skepticism and suspicion about my ability to manage my classroom. The implication was that I took an action that caused a student to violate the code of conduct. It needs to be said that this happened multiple times to both me and my colleagues. I employ a wide array of classroom management techniques that are especially geared toward supporting and introducing students to the college classroom. To be clear, I have only ever reached out to student discipline when I have exhausted all of my resources for dealing with the student's behavior, so to be met with the assumption that I have caused a student's misconduct when I'm reaching out for help is, only not, is not only insulting and demeaning, but it also makes me less inclined to reach out for help in the future. Lastly, communication about student misconduct incidents was lacking in the extreme. Rarely did student conduct follow up with me about how the issue was resolved, leaving me at times feeling very uneasy and insecure about the outcome. When there was a follow-up, it came weeks later in the form of a somewhat vague email. This left me in a constant state of worry and concern about whether the student would return to class or campus. This is an especially dangerous situation when students pose threats to campus safety. Classroom management technique, techniques will not resolve issues with students who wish to cause harm or who cannot or will not adhere to classroom or campus policies. Often, an instructor's call to student discipline is the first alarm bell in such situations. It is my hope in the future, student discipline will be an office that is seen to provide support to both students and faculty. That is the end of Catherine's letter. And I want to end with the reminder that FA is a partner 
in, with the district in achieving student success. And the working conditions of our faculty are the learning conditions of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Janae. Uh, item 2.10, AFT bargaining uh, president's report. Um, we will not have a report um, um, from the bargaining president of AFT tonight. Item 2.11, uh, Chai bargaining president report. I don't see Karen in the room, so we're going to move on to item 2.12 uh, and welcome our new faculty, um, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, with your permission, I'm going to defer to Vice President Kathy Scott to introduce our Thank you. faculty. Thank you, President Zia. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that I'm absolutely thrilled with this group of, of new faculty. Um, it was the first time um, Dr. Munoz and I have been able to interview and help bring in a new group, and we just could not be more pleased. Uh, we think that you're an exceptional group, and we're very happy to have you here with us tonight. Um, I'm going to give the honor of introducing them to uh, Jerry Florence, who is a member of our Senate Executive Committee and the leader of our faculty professional development. And she's been working very closely with them and doing a phenomenal job. So, Jerry, please. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Good evening, Superintendent President Romali, Board President Zia, members of the board, LBCC administrative faculty classified and administrative colleagues and students, most importantly, the students. My name is Jerry Florence, and it has been a great good fortune of mine to serve as the Faculty Professional Development Coordinator. In this role, I have the most wonderful opportunity of working annually with our new faculty cohorts. This fall, Long Beach City College welcomed eight new members to the ranks of tenured faculty. They are enthusiastic, dedicated, motivated, and ready to inspire the students in their classrooms. In mid-August, they participated in two full days of orientation on both the LAC and the PCC campuses. They also took advantage of Canvas training. They will continue their professional growth by attending College Culture Friday programs throughout their first year on campus. In the last five years, the college has embraced 155 new faculty that is simply amazing. The infusion of a creative ideas, content expertise, passion for student success, and a commitment to this institution that they now are an integral part of assures us that the best days of Long Beach City College are right in front of us. One could not be here tonight due to a teaching conflict, but at this time I'm going to ask that this year's new cohort join me at the podium and they're going to share with you their names and the discipline in which they teach. So I know that you are aware that a fun tradition began a couple of years ago. Each of the cohorts, in order to distinguish themselves from one another and to make their mark as the newest faculties on, faculty on campus, have put their heads and hearts together to select a clever moniker that embraces their unique spot in the college's history. You remember being introduced to the Fabulous 42, the Top Pick 36, the Worth the Weight 28, and the 27 who became Free Cube. Tonight, it is my absolute delight to introduce you to the Elite Eight. Please let me turn the microphone over to them so that they can introduce themselves to you. Hi, good evening. My name is Laura Garcia, and I'm a counselor. Good evening, Robert Olmos, Counseling Department. Good evening, everyone. I am Kimberly Davis, Computer Science Department. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Muldrow, and I am also in the Computer Science Department. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Ama Bwatrawa, and I'm in uh, Anthropology. Hi, I'm Morgan Roth, and I am in Life Science. So biology. Woo! Hello, everybody. I'm Nicole Evans. I'm in nursing. And we're missing Donella, and she is in uh, the sciences. Um, let me see. Where are we? OK, so before closing, I would like to give special recognition to our faculty professional development senior office assistant, 
Catherine Conchata, or as she is lovingly referred to, not only by all of the new faculty cohorts throughout the years, but me specifically, Catherine the Great. Uh, she, that should give you an idea of how much we all value her. She was an LBCC alumni. She was part of the uh, ambassador program, president's ambassador program. And then she left and went to Berkeley and got her degree. But the most important thing is that she's back in FPD. So Catherine, would you stand and let us thank you for your hard work? Thank you to Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Kathy Scott, and Vice President of Student Support Services, Dr. Mike Munoz, for your participation in the hiring process this last spring, and most importantly, for joining us the very first morning of new faculty orientation to welcome the newest members of the Viking family. They really appreciated your, you being there. Thank you to Dr. Ramali, who joined us the next morning for breakfast and conversation. For the new faculty to have the superintendent president all to themselves was just off the chart. And they, as she shared with them her vision for Long Beach City College, her passion for the students we serve, her enthusiastic, enthusiastic response for the faculty in the classroom, it was special. And they are members of your fan club, brand new members of your fan club. Long Beach City College's comprehensive new faculty program is due to the ongoing commitment of the Academic Senate. Of the responsibilities that are entrusted to them by this board, one is the most important to them, and that is faculty professional development. We are particularly proud and dedicated to this endeavor. Under the strong leadership of Academic Senate President Jorge Ochoa, the personal and professional growth of all faculty on campus is championed. It is an honor to be a member of Jorge's executive team. I would like to acknowledge Board Secretary Jack Hahn, whose efforts behind the scene provided the opportunity for us to be on the agenda tonight, and we appreciate so much for you working on our behalf. We thank you for that. And before I wrap up, this wasn't something I had planned, but I've just learned over the years when you get a chance to say thank you to somebody, you want to say thank you. And I want to thank Dr. John Fofa, who taught me about teamwork, who taught me about Long Beach City College, who taught me so many things I'll never be able to say thank you for. But luckily, there's so many people in the room that can say they were trained by him and loved by him and befriended by him, that he's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame this year. And I am just so honored to be the first to say. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I wouldn't be the teacher I am today without you. I thank you so much. So at this time, I just want to thank again the board, the administration, Dr. Molly, for sure. Uh, these new folks are going to be a great addition to the college. And I thank you for having us. And I thank you for letting them introduce themselves to you. Thank you so very much. It's going to be a great year for the Elite Eight. Thank you, Jerry. Um, hold on tight. We're going to take a picture with you guys and personally welcome you. Let's go out, out there.
All right, item 2.3, reordering of the agenda. We will be reordering item 3.2 um, with 3.1, so we can um, have our resolution for the LBGTQ uh, History Month uh, heard first. Um, with that, I'm gonna move on to item 2.14, public comments on agenda items. The public is allowed to address the board before or during the consideration of any item on the agenda, a total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. And I will extend it if you need more time. So we have a couple of speaker cards. Did everybody fill out a speaker card? We're just gonna have two speakers. Um, our first, um, well, it's uh, under 2.14, we first hear the comments. Um, Mr. Porter Gilberg, if you can please uh, come and speak. Welcome, Porter, and Shana Tova. Happy New Year to you. Thank you, President Zia, Shana Tova to you, Thank and you. to everybody at well. LBCC. <laughs> um, Thank you um, so much for inviting us uh, here today. So my name is Porter Gilberg. I'm the executive director at the LGBTQ Center of Long Beach, and I'm joined by our board president and chair, Justin Potier. And uh, we want to thank um, both, uh, both staff and board leadership in bringing forth a resolution to honor LGBTQ History Month. Um, I know in my working relationship with LBCC um, through Dr. Munoz, even in the last you know month, um, and that's also a testament to uh, President Superintendent Dr. Ramali's leadership. Um, we are very impressed with the leadership around LGBTQ student equity, um, and so to know that that the board is not just considering a resolution, but a resolution that uh, includes material action, including the new uh, Brave Space campaign, including updating all student records with uh, preferred name um, in line with what LBUSD and Cal State University Long Beach have been doing for some time. Um, the center is incredibly uh, proud to be a part of uh, collaboration with LBCC. We're incredibly honored to work with uh, Trustee Ntuk um, and with President Zia. So thank you so much for thinking of the LGBTQ community and our needs. We know that LGBTQ people continue to face tremendous barriers and, dispar and disparities in economic equity. I'm an alum of LBCC and I didn't have the opportunity for a preferred name policy, which I know made, school, uh, made coming to school very difficult sometimes as I had to out myself as a gender non-conforming -conform person time and time again. So to know that um, students are now going to have those opportunities to come to school and be and be authentic and a little safer um, means the world to us at the center and, and is going to mean uh, the world to the students attending LBCC. So thank you so much. Our second speaker is Lorena Corbell, and forgive me if I'm uh, not doing a good job on pronouncing your name. This is also going to be on item 3.2. Welcome, Lorena. No, that was perfect pronunciation. Um, hello everyone, my name is Lorena and I'm a second year full-time student here at LBCC. I'm also the president of the Queer Space Club on campus and there's a few other Queer Space members here present. Um, I started this school year with the goal of not only transferring by the end of, by next fall, but also by working really hard to make sure that trans and gender non-conforming students on this campus have a way to identify with the pronoun and name that they prefer and also to work towards getting bathroom access for gender non-conforming people. I've worked last year with our advisor, uh, Professor Hollenberg, on some of these issues. And not to take away from the congratulatory energy of this resolution, but the work has been kind of frustrating. There's been a lot of closed doors. Um, there's been a lot of non-response on emails. And so to have a metric to hold um, people accountable to by the passing of this resolution to be able to take part in some of the really beautiful aspects of what it means to be part of the queer community is really encouraging. And just to reaffirm myself as a student and as a club member that I'm very dedicated to these issues that my community and my people are very dear to me and we have a bunch of different voices. So I thank you again in honoring the presence that the queer community has always had on campus, whether it's stifled or not. And um, it goes a long way to making students feel more comfortable here on campus in their classrooms 
when people at the higher levels are talking about them. And I also know it makes faculty feel more comfortable here. Um, so I really appreciate this gesture. I appreciate maybe an opening of certain doors to work alongside people to achieve some of my goals for this year. And I'm just really appreciative to be working with a board that's open. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Great. We will now hear um, item 3.2, um, re resolution for OBGTQ History Month of, uh, in October. Um, the action before us is that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution number 0912188A, recognizing October 2018 as LGBTQ History Month as submitted. And this is in the spirit of promoting and elevating tolerance, inclusiveness, and kindness of all students, families, and staff. The Long Beach Community College District affirms their support and commitment to ensuring a safe educational environment and a diverse and open campus. Um, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Trustee Otto, uh, seconded by uh, Trustee Intuk. Um, I will give you an opportunity for questions and comments, but before I do, I want to personally thank Trustee Intuk for his leadership. This was really um, his foresight. Uh, Trustee Intuk brought it before us, and I think you deserve the commendation, and thank you for um, bringing, us to this, uh, to our, uh, bringing this to our attention so that we can formally acknowledge and recognize month of October um, as the LBGTQ History Month. Um, with that, um, does anyone have any comments? Uh, I'm sure you do, Trustee Intuk. Hey, thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank the board and my colleagues for bringing this item up. Um, this, um, you know, one of the reasons I, I ran for this office and to be on this board was about restoring the community and the community college. And there uh, is such a rich history in Long Beach from you know, Mayor Garcia to Billie Jean King, the superstar tennis player that we have, that it's, to me is critical that we're letting everyone know that you're welcome at Long Beach City College, whether it's students, staff, faculty, your families, uh, there's a place for you. Uh, we want to continue to be a community asset, uh, that everyone has access and opportunities to the training and educational programs that we offer. Um, and I really think tonight is a reaffirmation of our commitment to equity, equality, diversity, not just in written paper, but to me this is the beginning of a process of reevaluating and seeing where can we improve, how we can we do better, what are other institutions doing that we're not doing that we can make sure that we provide the best, safest, uh, and proudest experience that we can have here at Long Beach City College. Um, and I, I just wanna uh, thank uh, Porter for his leadership. Uh, we've worked together in so many other avenues in the city um, and I've been to the center dozens of times uh, but he welcomed me, took me on a tour. You know, I had not been to the health clinics. I didn't know about some of the professional services that are offered on site. Uh, it really was an eye-opening experience and I, I hope uh, my other colleagues and, and staff members will consider uh, coming for a, a visit of the center and a tour to see for yourself. Uh, and I'm excited about the opportunities to partner. Uh, our college, we, we really need to be a community partner with, with everyone in our community. And there's so many great community organizations. Um, the, the LGBT Center is just really one of the premier ones and I think it's, it's exciting what we're uh, going endeavor uh, together. And it's really great to hear uh, the students see it already. Um, you know, and it's, uh, so many times I, th I think, you know, folks might overlook the challenges, um, you know, it's, I was at the Human Relations Commission meeting last week talking about the increase in hate crimes uh, and the disproportionate impact on the LGBT community, but also the African American community. It's really an intersectional uh, challenge uh, that's facing the community that's happening here in Long Beach, here in California. Uh, and so it's, I think you, we look at what's happening at the national level and, and it's really important that at the local level that we can say we're different, that we can say we're inclusive, uh, and that we can show it through our, our, our words and actions. So I'm in full support of the resolution tonight and ask my colleagues to join me. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Antuk. Um Anybody else? So yes, uh, Vice President Malaulu. First of all, I would like to welcome our guests who represent the LGBTQ community to our campus. 
and to our meeting and I'd like to thank you for the remarks that you've expressed and just you know being a part of this um, historic event on campus is really um, it's beautiful to see I would also like to commend Trustee Untuck for his leadership in this resolution and I would also like to thank thank the staff and the faculty and the students, particularly our administrators on campus, for being receptive to this. In closing, I just want to call your attention, and um, it's online and probably it'll be behind me, but the third paragraph of the resolution, um, you know, it's all good and it's all really neat and well written, but the third paragraph says, whereas Long Beach City College recognizes our community's diversity is one of our greatest strengths. And I'd just like to remind everyone that diversity is such a multi-dimensional entity and it involves you know, all, all people from all walks of life and all backgrounds. And that's one of my favorite uh, passages in that resolution. So we, we welcome that and it is definitely one of our strengths. Thank you very much, congratulations. Chestiato, would you like to say a few words? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I am uh, very proud to make this motion and to support it wholeheartedly. As some of you, but probably most of you, don't know, I had a brother that was gay and uh, actually died in 1988 uh, of AIDS. It was one of the first victims of AIDS, and I've been a staunch supporter of the, uh, the, the community uh, ever since that time and have watched uh, what has happened uh, 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 over time, and I'm so proud that the community has achieved what it's achieved now, and I want to make have, give my own personal welcome to you on this campus. I want to let you know if there's any way I can be successful. I've been to the center many, many, many times and know many, many people who regularly attend meetings there, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is a, a great thing for Long Beach City College to do. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Otto. That, um, that was very profound. Uh, I, too, want to share the sentiment of my colleagues. And um, I, I know, Porter, you and I have worked on some issues that we've had in the past. And it really is a new day. There was a time that, not in a distant, not too distant past, that our LGBTQ faculty did not feel welcome. And I really owe it to you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, for your leadership and the loving atmosphere you've created. It was to a point they wouldn't participate in the Pride Parade. And I think this is an important step for us to turn um, the uh, page and really make it much more meaningful, and not just with a resolution. Uh, I know I'm confident in you and your team that you are going to make it meaningful in every step and action you t we take as a district. Um, so with that, I'd like to call um, for the vote. And then um, after the vote, I'd like to, I know we have a group of folks uh, um, who are here in support of this resolution. If we can take a picture, if that's okay with you guys, we'd love to have a picture with you and our students. Yes, Trustee and uh, Item, I, I just wanted to recognize the board president, Justin. Um, it's so ironic. We grew up together and we're in Boy Scouts wow. 30 years ago. So it's uh, great to see uh, your leadership and continue on to, to serve the community. I wanted to just recognize and thank you for being here tonight. There's no longer six degrees of separation. Huh? It's one, <laughs> one degree. For Eagle Scouts. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, call for the vote. Let's do this. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Absolutely. And student trustee Jones? Aye. So um, we're going to take a picture, but I just wanted to just also mention, I failed to mention this. Uh, the reason why trustee Baxter couldn't be here before us tonight is because she had a surgery and she had to be in recovery in a hospital. So otherwise, uh, she would be here and would gladly vote for this item. So let's go ahead and take a picture with your beautiful delegation.
Thank you to you. I'm sure you're going to stick around for our budget hearing um, and meeting and all our reports. <laughs> you're more than welcome to, but um, if you need to leave, we will, our feelings will not be hurt. So we're going to move to item 3.1, a public hearing on the proposed um, budget of the district for the year ending uh, June 30th, 2019. Um, the California Code of Regulations, Title V, Section 58301 states that the governing board of each community college district shall, have, shall hold a public hearing on the proposed budget for the ensuing fiscal year on or before the 15th day of September, but at least three days following availability of the proposed budget for public inspection. Notification was published in the press telegram on August 29, 2018, that the public hearing will be held at the Liberal Arts Campus Building T, Boardroom T, 1100 on Tuesday, September 12, 2018 at 5 p.m. and that the proposed budget of the Long Beach Community College District for 2018-2019 was available for public inspection in the Fiscal Services Department Building T, Room T, 2003 for, from September 4, 2018 through September 10, 2018 during the hours of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Do we, is, uh, this is the time set aside for the public to express its views on the 2018-2019 adopted budget. Is there anyone who would like to speak on the budget? Hearing no response, I now declare the public hearing closed. Okay, moving on to item 3.3, revised board policy and administration, administrative regulation 2001 board travel. We have um, had this come before us in the uh, previous board meeting, and this is the first reading of the revised board policy 2001 board travel, revised administration, uh, administrative regulation 2001 board travel submitted for informational purposes only and does not require board action. Discussion between board members regarding the board's travel expense, as I mentioned earlier, took place at the meeting of August 21, 2018. Um, I requested that the travel budget be revised to include an expense threshold of $3,300 for each board member per fiscal year, 25% um, cut to our travel um, in solidarity with the deficit that we're experiencing and the cuts that we're doing to our expenses to minimize um, uh, extra spending in an era of austerity. So um, with that, uh, I think we don't have any action on this front. Um, we can move on to item 3.4, Trustee Facilities Committee. Um, and the purpose of this uh, item is that the Board of Trustee appoint the appointment of, approve the appointment of two members of the board to serve on the Trustee Facilities Committee. The scope of the standing subcommittee's functions um, would be to review and provide input on facilities project. This is a new subcommittee that we are forming and myself and Trustee Intuk will be serving on that uh, committee. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. Motion by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Intuk. Um, call for the vote. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Uh, aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Uh, and po student. Point, point of order, do we need a vote on this? To, uh, for it is an action item, Trustee uh, Otto. We have to vote. New permanent committee. New standing. Okay. It's a committee. That there's a reason why it's called action. But thank you for bringing that. I, I was wondering about that myself. Sorry. And Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Jones. Aye. And, and just for housekeeping purposes, we probably should call it the Trustees Facilities Committee. Um, I guess maybe it doesn't make any difference um, to be a subcommittee or a committee, but I. You know, that's a great, great idea and great point, um, Trustee Otto. I th calling it, um, su instead of subcommittee, a committee. And, and, we, we, and for clarity's sake, because of the way we're doing this, I think we ought to call it the standing committee. Um, yeah, that's what it was read. Um, 
and we've ha had the opportunity for discussion. So I'm going to move on to item 4.1. Um, I know you guys are have been patiently waiting the LBCC Foundation report. Thank you so much for being here. We have a presentation. It's an information item. All discussions and comments have been concluded on the item. We've. Uh, Do we skip the 3.1? Are we going to go to that later? We already did that. The budget? Mm -hmm. That was a hearing. Hearing, okay. okay. That's the public item 4.1, um, the foundation report. And this is an information uh, only item. Thank you so much for your patience. I'm trying to move this along as fast as possible. So, as you can see, um, uh, Executive Director Elizabeth McCann is here before us, and President-elect, uh, LBCC Foundation uh, Board of Governors, Lori Brault. Um, they will be presenting a report of the foundation, so the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, Board of Trustees, President Ramali, uh, Vice Presidents, audience, thank you for coming. This, and giving us this opportunity to report on all the exciting happenings at the LBCC Foundation. Um, thank you for the introductions. Liz and I are going to do this on a sort of a dog and pony show, so bear with our changing people here and there. All right. I'm going to start out and talk about the background of Long Beach City uh, College Foundation. We were established in 1978 as a nonprofit. And we were established as a fundraising vehicle for the college. The LBCC Foundation is separate as a 501c3. We are governed by a board of 80 governors and led by an executive committee of 17, 12 of whom are voting members, who set policy and procedures for the foundation and the Board of Governors of LBCC Foundation truly are a who's who of Long Beach. I'd like to introduce the governors who are in the audience tonight, uh, one of whom you've already heard about, John Philpa. And if you'll stand when I call your name, I can't really see you, but I'll appreciate that, um, who is going to be inducted into our Hall of Fame as well. Um, the other guests here are Rick Duree, a member at large of our associate group, uh, Barbara Ellis, who's a member at large, John Philpa, I've already introduced, he's our Vice President of Grants, Gary Heron from the Board of Governors is here, Jack Hinchy, who's on the Audit Committee, he's the Chair, uh, Aaron Moore, who's our Secretary, Brian Russell, and Sumner Temple, who's our vice president. And this is our lovely group. Thank you very much. Now, we also, did I miss anybody? We also have, uh, this morning, did you all read your local news in the press telegram? One of our late board of governors, uh, who has been worked at every city, every city school, as well as being on the board of governors, and that is, and today he had a library named after him, and Barbara Ellis, who is his wife, did the opening ceremony, and so I just wanted to let you know that he was one of our very special board of governors. Um, we also have a staff here. We have four part-time and four full-time faculty employees. And I'd like to introduce Nancy Yoho, who's our associate director. Um, Lynn Dexter can't be here tonight. Uh, Jennifer Bourgeois, assistant director for alumni. Um, Lois Schneider, senior administrative assistant. Now you made me lose my place. Um, and Matt Guadabusco. No, Guada. Help me, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Matt is a new member of our staff. And Cindy McKay, who's our data entry specialist. Thank you for our staff. 
Uh, next, we have our mission and vision. And we really want to uh, share with you that our mission is to raise funds to support the college, whatever we say. Our vision is that we value education and we recognize LBCC's role as a gateway to the future for our community. And we want to enhance that role as a supporter in the foundation. Finally, I want to tell you some of the good news. The foundation assets as of June 30th are $18,154,199. One more dollar would have made it 200. It's up from 3,900 plus in our 2017 report. So we're very proud of our foundation efforts in getting new money for the college. Liz. All right, thank you everybody for having us here this evening. I'm gonna go over um, some of our finances and just bear with me because I'm also doing my own tech support, so. <laughs> um, so here's a snapshot of our 2017, 2018. These are our unaudited financial reports. I just wanna let everybody know that we are in the midst of our annual audit in the foundation and um, it'll be finalized in January. We're not expecting um, any changes really to these numbers. But I also wanna share that the foundation recently changed our longtime relationship with our audit partners. And we're now using the same auditor that the college uses, Clifton Larson LLP. Um, we've been absolutely pleased. This is our second year with our new auditors. We are so pleased with the relationship and we really just felt like after so many years, it was time to have a fresh set of eyes on our financials, our policies, and our procedures. And so we're, we're really um, grateful for that. And also to our, our new audit chair, Jack Finchy. So on the income side, you'll see that we have 3.1 million in gifts, about 885,000 coming in from Goldman Sachs for the 10,000 small businesses program. We have 285,000 in unrealized gains. 68,000 in realized gains. We have a negative 22,000, which is a change in a beneficial interest. And what this is, is it's a trust that's held outside of the foundation dollars. When we, do bring, um, when we did bring in a new auditor, they made some adjustments to the calculations. So that, that's why we have that change in, in the interest there. We have 413,000 in dividends and interest and 1.2 in other income that comes in for program support and some other things that we can't really classify as gifts. So for example, if an outside agency is awarding scholarships to students but they've identified the student, we can't count that as a gift, so it's considered other income. On the expense side, we have 1.1 million in scholarships, 18,000 in grants to our faculty and staff for their programs, and I do wanna just, I'm gonna plug this a couple times tonight, but we actually, um, we, budget every year $40,000 for faculty and staff projects and the application process comes up in the early spring. Not all of the funds get claimed each year. So even though we award the full amount, um, our faculty and staff are really, um, they're, they're thrifty and they're spending there. So I want to encourage you all to take advantage of those foundation grants. Um, let's see, we have 1.4 million in program support, and if you combine that with the support that goes to the 10,000 small businesses program, it's truly closer to about 2.3 million in program support and 696,000 in our operating expenses. And our operating expenses represent 12% of our income, which for nonprofit standards keeps us well within the 80-20 rule and we're very proud that we do keep our expenses low. I had a meeting recently with a funder who's looking to give their third gift to the LBCC Foundation to support our programs and they were reviewing our 990s with us, our tax returns, and they were just immediately taken um, by how low we do keep our expenses, particularly um, how low we keep our fundraising expenses, which is only 10% of the 12%. And that was actually a, a higher year for us because we had some extra expenses associated with some larger gifts that came in. So we're very proud of that. 
Um, you'll also note that there is an, an about a $1.8 million difference between our income and our expenses, and that $1.8 million uh, represents um, endowment gifts that were directed by the donors to be invested um, back into our endowment. Right, and then our foundation expenses, the trends over the past five years, you'll see um, it includes, again, going back to the past slide, our expenses include program support, scholarship, support to our departments and our associate groups and operations. Um, they've gone down over the past five years. I would say one of the biggest change in our expenses has been to the, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses when the program, um, and going back to 2014, that program was bringing in about 3.3 million Goldman Sachs' support is now, as you probably noted, at about 885,000. So while the expenses there have gone uh, down, the income um, from Goldman Sachs has gone down, what has surged over the past five, and particularly in the past two years, two plus years, has been um, income on gifts. So we're excited about that. And just a recap of some of the highlights from last year and the ways that we've supported our faculty and staff and our programs here at the college. We awarded over $1 million in scholarships, uh, close to $500,000 for College Promise. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramali, for acknowledging that. That was excited, and I know, I know my board members and uh, staff were excited to hear that, too. Um, again, Plugging the $40,000 that we budget for faculty and staff uh, grants. We love giving out that money, and we have a wonderful grants committee that gets excited about those um, applications every year. $1.2 million to support um, our college programs. $10,000 to the LEAD Academy, and I'm very excited about this one because I am a, a graduate of the LEAD Academy. Um, and then also not noted on this slide um, is the uh, $5,500 that we gave to the college for College Day and that we're just so thrilled to be involved and really look forward to future college, day, college days. And I'm going to hand it back over to Lori. Please enjoy. And the microphone. No, I'll find it here. <laughs> uh, we've been going through a strategic plan initiative that started in 2014 and goes through 2019. And the four areas that we're looking at is scholarship and grant awards and fundraising are the first two. And of course, we've always been involved with that, but we can always make it better. And we have some ways to do that. We also have um, decided that this two years, we would focus very heavily on operations and infrastructure. And as Liz goes over our accomplishments, you'll see that's where we worked very hard. And, and an alumni engagement, so we're trying to get a robust alumni database. We are kind of lagging behind other colleges, so we want to improve the alumni engagement. And Jeff, uh, we do, every year we go over this and go over what we've done last year. And Jeff Wood is going to be joining us from the president's office. He's the director of the president's office and will be joining us on the strategic plan for this year, which is 1819. Yes. Sorry, I'm not loud enough. I just wanted to review some of the accomplishments for the, from the past couple years um, in the foundation. We did complete the rebranding of both the foundation and the alumni association that now includes branding guidelines. So previously, um, there wasn't really a lot of consistency with our logo and our brand, and we were kind of going back and forth between two and a couple different color schemes. But we um, partnered with the college and used the college's branding guidelines to inform our branding guidelines so that we can adopt a similar you know, look and feel in terms of hand tones and proper use of the logo, and so we've, we've done that. Um, we've implemented a quarterly electronic newsletter for the foundation, which has saved us money. We were in a print version prior. Um, so not only has an electronic version saved us money, it's also allowed us a wider distribution. 
Um, and then our Alumni Association has implemented a monthly uh, newsletter, and I want to thank um, Jennifer and Nancy for that. Um, we've also expanded the President's Circle, the President's Partners, to include higher support levels for corporate partners. We've expanded our prospect list there, and we want to continue to expand our prospect list there. And then also, um, these efforts have led to an increase in giving. We've implemented a staffing plan. Lori was talking about infrastructure, which is a big part of our strategic plan. So we have implemented a staffing plan that really helps us move our strategic plan forward. We created job descriptions, which never existed before. Um, we reassigned staff around our key initiatives um, and priorities. And we have um, made an effort to also try and um, redirect our, our resources so that we could have more full-time employees. So we've hired an associate director, Nancy Yoho, who is focused on operations, um, and another, an assistant director for alumni development, Jennifer Bourgeois, who focuses on alumni outreach and fundraising. And then we're um, just steadily trying to look at our staffing plan and ensure that we're, we're on the right track to meet our goals. We've also received several um, significant gifts of endowment to support our programs and College Promise in perpetuity. We celebrated the college's 90, 90th birthday with a successful gala, which we are going to talk more about as we get a little bit further into the presentation. As you can see, we have received a number of notable gifts and grants. This is for 216-18, which is just two years, those that are over $25,000. So as you can see, we have the Goldman uh, Sachs and the Anonymous, but we really want to focus on three of our gifts. One of them is from, or many of them are from, the Don Temple family charitable foundation and they have given us a math success program and I want to get all of these and for the uh, I have lost my notes on that program aha math success center the college promise the temple family student scholarship and the gala as well as a new board member who is summer temple who we introduced earlier this family has given us so much in these last two years but this only represents two years I also want to highlight the Munzer Foundation, which is a little further down. It's one of our new donors, one that Liz has cultivated. And the $50,000 represents two grants for the child development centers. And it's going to provide shade structures to protect the kids from harmful UV rays so that they can spend more time in their outdoor classroom. Also, there was some equipment for STEM in the grant for our young scholars. Liz uh, just submitted a proposal for what will hopefully be our third year of funding from the Munzer Foundation to support the garden curriculum at the centers. And finally, uh, we wanna recognize one of the foundation's most supportive donors over the 40 year history. Our very own Virginia Baxter, who's in the hospital and not with us tonight, our trustee. The number of her giving is just a small fraction of her incredible generosity to the college. We are so grateful to her, and I know her peers, colleagues, and friends are too, and we wish her well. Thank you, Lori. And I just, again, I want to reiterate my thanks to Summer Temple and to Ginny Baxter. Um, I just, I'm going to share a couple of our our goals for the upcoming year. So yes, one of them is in all caps <laughs> because really to me and to my team, this is our most important goal this year and that's developing a robust alumni database so that we can truly, um, truly reach out to our alumni, increase the profile of the college and the foundation, provide more support to, um, to our programs here. And I actually, I mean, the timing of this is impeccable because I came from a roundtable 
of all foundation um, executive directors from the state of California today. And Lori said this, we are behind our peers. Um, LACC was our host today. They have an alumni database of 700,000. Um, uh, the perfect anecdote that I really love, though, was Glendale Community College. And my colleague there, she, um, they started a little smaller. They have 250,000 um, alumni that they can reach out to through their database. And due to, the, due to that outreach, they've raised a million dollars. So I think this is just going to be so huge for us. I really want to thank Superintendent uh, President Ramali because she's been a true champion in helping this move forward and also working with Heather Van, um, Van Volkenberg. I think we're going to see some real traction here and it is so, it's so exciting. So um, that was just one. Um, the other thing, and this is step two to creating the alumni database, is creating and implementing an annual fund. So once we have all of our, our contact information beyond um, the donor database that we manage in the foundation, it's you know, being able to do that outreach on a regular basis to, um, to bring in more funding for the college. And then continuing to expand our president's partners. We're really looking to the college to help us grow the president's partners by making those, um, you know, partnering with our, our corporate partners here in the community. I think that'll be um, some key relationships that we can build there. And then launching a cohesive um, employee giving campaign. So we have payroll deduction at the college. Um, in the past, the, out, the way we have gone about securing our um, employee deduction gifts has been through the new employee orientation which these are new employees. They're not, they haven't kind of drank, you know, all the Viking Kool-Aid here yet. So I think um, just being able to put something to, together where we have a goal and we have something cohesive that we're launching and everybody can still give to their individual department funds too, um, that'll be key. So we'll stay tuned on that one. Um, and then also beginning the steps to launch our next campaign to endow uh, Long Beach College Promise Scholarships. And I know Superintendent President Ramali touched on this. I think we're, we're having some really exciting discussions about College Promise and where we move that, um, how we move that forward. All right. Now we're going to talk about the gala. First, before we get into this presentation, though, um, there are some key people that I really want to thank. Um, so first, I don't know if they're here, but yes, I see. Uh, so first, Stacy Toda and Camille Bolton. Um, wow, I we really could not have done this without the two of you. Um, Stacy worked with me to set the vision for the videos that were shown at the gala, and these two ladies just took off running and made that happen. And I'm so grateful. And not only that, but they were there the whole night and before the whole night um, and just were truly our go-to gals that night. So thank you. Um, <laughs> Jerome Thomas for not only taking beautiful photos, but he also dressed up in character as a vintage uh, press person. So I have to give him props there. Our amazing facilities team, particularly Medhani Afram and uh, Cheryl Williams, their, their teams were just amazing to work with. I could go on and on, Sean Ravel, Sean Michael, Michael Burke. Um, they really just went above and beyond and were just the nicest people to work with too. Um, the faculty and staff who provided the experiences for the silent auction, Brendan Hayes and Lubert, who coordinated our parking, our president's ambassadors, um, Rich Dicker, who was the voice of the gala, and I know this sounds like a, a, an award acceptance speech, and I don't want to forget anybody, but they just really need to be thanked. So our gala committee, you all know who you are, and you were a treat to work with. And then the amazing foundation team. Um, I am so lucky to have this incredible group of people that I work with, and this would not have happened without you, so thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to do a little recap of the event. Um, for some photos, so here was the outside. I'll just go through these quickly. And here is our president of the trustees, Sunny, and our gala sponsors. So um, we were able to raise over $112,000 through our 19 generous sponsors of the um, 90th anniversary gala. 
And again, I just want to highlight our title sponsor, Don Temple Storage. She was celebrating their 50th anniversary and the Don Temple Family Charitable Foundation for their support. Um, I also want to thank Cordoba Corporation, who served as our diamond sponsor and has been a longtime loyal supporter of LBCC as well. Photos, and there is our, I call her our flapper in chief, uh, Superintendent President Reagan Ramali, and our trustee, Virginia Baxter. And our gala underwriters, we really want to thank our generous sponsors who provided the underwriting opportunities for some of the components of the evening. Mary and George Crane, Barbara Ellis, who's here with us this evening, Long Beach Airport, Piper and Jaffray, and Ginny and Lloyd Wilcox. There's Vivian. Um, our individual ticket sales, we raised $18,000. Um, we raised over $17,000 through our program ads and $2,000 through donations that were mailed in in lieu of attendance. We also provided complimentary tickets to 55 college trustees, administrators, faculty, and staff and community leaders. And this uh, represented about $14,000. Um, we did this because we think all of you are so important and we absolutely want you at our event. Um, so I, I don't know if you've all noticed, but we did stop the practice of uh, charging our trustees and our administrators to attend foundation events. And again, that's because we really want you there and we want the only barrier um, for your attending foundation event, events to be the busy schedules that you all maintain, because I honestly don't know how you all do it. Um, and so anyway, the total that we raised for what I'm calling other income was 30, a little over $37,000. There's Doug and Frida. All right. So um, the true purpose of this event was not really meant to be a fundraiser. It was an event to, um, to celebrate the 90th anniversary, to engage people, bring them to our college to showcase this beautiful campus that we have here. So, um, but we decided that, um, you know, the, the college, the foundation has never had a signature fundraising event. So we kind of wanted to test the waters, dip our toes in, and plant the seed for possibly doing an annual or maybe every other year um, fundraiser for the college. So we decided to add two components to the evening um, as a fundraising piece that were laser focused on the mission of the college. So we did that through the silent auction. The silent auction was very small. As you probably noticed, we had um, just unique experiences that we were offering that will draw people back. They're unique experiences you can only have at Long Beach City College, and it'll bring the people back to our programs. And that was the intent there. And I want to just thank our director of athletics, Randy Tutor because not only did he provide the most experiences, um, I think there were six of them out of 17, um, and they were also some of the most popular, so thank you, Randy. Um, and then also for the first time, we decided to try out doing a live ask um, that would go directly back to College Promise. And you, know, you go to all of these galas in the community and you can pick up gift certificates to restaurants and trips. And we, didn't, we just didn't want to do that at this event. We really wanted this to be about the college and about the students. And so we decided to do a direct ask for college promise. Um, I set a goal that I think was really high for, uh, for our, for never doing this before. And that was $50,000 and I'm really glad to say that we exceeded it, so. And that, that will all go back to College Promise. So in this category, what we call gala evening fundraising, uh, we raised just a little shy of $58,000. There's Marlene and our chief of police and our mayor. Um, OK. So just a summary, our gala income totaled $213,065. Our expenses were 155, 142, and then our profit is just a little bit shy of that $58,000. Um, again, we didn't intend to um, really make this a fundraiser, but when we decided to add those components, um, uh, we just really thought that was important. Um, we really are um, proud of the event. We've gotten a lot of feedback from the community. Um, 
we've heard from some of our long, longest time supporters here that this was uh, one of the best LBCC events that they had been to and they felt really proud to be a part of the college. Um, this is my shameless plug that it is not too late to give to support uh, the college's 90th anniversary. I think we can take 90th anniversary gifts until we turn 100. So um, we're really hoping, you know, these numbers are not, you know, they're not final. They're going to, um, we hope that income or, you know, the income to support the 90th will continue. So that is our report. Thank you, Liz and Lori. I'm going to open it up for questions as an information item. Um, trustees, any comments, questions? Trustee Otto? Okay. Um, I'll go about, about this in a long about a roundabout way. So my wife's sister is in town, so she has the spare bedroom, and my wife said, do they mention what the rotary contribution is to the Long Beach uh, Foundation every year? Because she's a member of Rotary and the uh, chairman of the membership committee, and I'd like to have a place to sleep tonight. Well, I will um, say that the Long Beach Rotary Scholarship Foundation gives our amazing students here, who actually are, I, I think of them as a partner in College Promise because they do support our students who come here from our local schools, and I'm a proud Rotary member too, and I know many of you are. Um, over $100,000, it's like 102,000 and, you know, comma, many uh, numbers right after that. So I don't have an exact number, but it is over $100,000 that we receive every year from the Rotary Scholarship Foundation. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> Trustees, anybody else? Any questions? Um, Vice President Malauulu has a question. First of all, I just want to thank both of you and your staff for being here and uh, once again presenting such a thorough report, um, visually appealing, well organized, uh, lots of great information, the photos, just really well done. I, I enjoy uh, reports like this. Thank you very much. Um, at the risk of sounding, you know, playing devil's advocate, I, I do have a question that, you know, is, is probably not a good one, but Go to page four of your presentation, and um, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. I I understand that I'm probably feeding into a bad rumor, but I don't like to ignore the elephant in the room. Um, I've heard both on and off campus that the foundation is low on funds, is not raising enough money, and I'm looking at these numbers and I, I'm trying to figure out why anybody would say that. Why would you know if we're up? almost $4 million from 2017, and 18 million is a super healthy amount to have in the foundation. I just, I want to put to rest any doubt or any hating that people might be doing on the foundation because, you know, these numbers don't lie. So I'd just like to know where somebody might get the impression that fundraising is down, it's not as high. Could you speak to that? Please? No, yeah, I don't know where they would get that information um, because it's it's not true. I mean, we uh, the numbers speak for themselves in our um, our financial our financial statements. Um, we have a robust endowment. So of these funds, um, we have our endowment is about fifteen million dollars, and then we have you know cash assets as well that are um, about three million. Um, gosh, I, I don't know where anybody would get that information because sure. they're not getting it from the foundation. We've had record-breaking fundraising years for the past several years. I'm um, just curious, when you uh, took over as executive director, was it, has it been three years already? Two and a half, yeah. So two and a half years ago, what were the assets at that time? Off the top of my head, um, around $14 million in total. So we're up $4 we, million we're up since four, you... Yes. Took over. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And Thank you. hopefully this will, you know, set the record straight for anybody who's doubtful or trying to cast some kind of... Um, I think Lori wants to say something. Yeah. Question. Uh, and Vivian, you'll be joining us, yes, I sir. hope, as our trustee member. And Looking we'll forward our, to it. We'll have our financials for you every month, and you can see exactly how we're doing and share that with the board and the audience and any naysayers. So thank you. I appreciate that, and I look forward to being there. I can't wait. 
Thank you, Vice President Malauulu, Trustee Entuk. Well, thank you so much for the presentation tonight. I just had a few questions. Um, can you tell me what's the percent of small donors to your uh, annual intake? Your, your percentage of small donors? Um, do you break it out by, or maybe individual contributors? Was that broken out in there and I, and I missed it? Liz, would you mind speaking to the mic? Sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. I would say there's no small donor because every gift is so important. So our gifts do range in size. They each have an impact. Um, we focused on the key. We were asked to report on the key, um, some key significant gifts that had come in recently, so we did that. But we can always, um, you know, break apart our, our data and, um, you know, break it down into different gift sizes. Very Oh, and you know, on that note, uh, Viviana, what you asked about the foundation, we are one of the largest community college foundations in the state of California. So. I was going to follow up on your comment of, of other college districts. Um, what, is, what are other districts doing, or what's the, what's the gap, say, from, I mean, LACCD is hard to compare against because they're, they're huge for database sizes. But we'll catch up with our, them. Our comparable districts, are, how are we doing as far as? annual fundraising amounts or endowment sizes of OCC or Santa Ana or, or Rancho Santiago? Yeah, I don't have comparative data on each of the different foundations, but I can absolutely get that. We brought in over five million last year, um, and that, I, you know, that's pretty considerable. Um, LACC, they have 20, I was just there today, so I know this, but they have $29 million in assets. I think with our efforts to, we are really doing this on a very tiny database um, in comparison. And I think that, you know, as we grow and expand, we are just, I mean, we're one of the largest foundations and we're, I feel like we're just getting started in a lot of ways. There's so much room for growth. I think we'll catch up with them soon. And then do you have uh, specific scholarships? Is there like Latino or API scholarships that students can apply for we or have communities fund? Yeah, we have over 800, I think close to 1,000 scholarships. Our scholarship process is open right now. Um, students can apply online, and then it closes out um, in the beginning of December. Scholarships are awarded every spring, and then they apply to the next fall and spring. But there are over 1,000 scholarships for a variety or a variety of different things and different students. Is it, is it listed on the website, all the variety? Where, where, where could you see that? Um, you know, I couldn't 100% answer that question right now with all the changes that have taken place on the website, the beautiful website. But I know we are still working to ensure that we get all the information that needs to be on that website on there. So there is, um, there, there is a link to the scholarship page that's maintained by the scholarship office here. And we have a really seamless application process. So that's available. Any other questions? Um, great, thank you. I wanted to, first of all, thank you so much. This was a fabulous report. I know we had asked for some enhancements and you made it right away, so really appreciate that. Um, and especially thank you to our generous donors and the folks that you brought today. Thank you for doing that. This is the biggest delegation I've seen. And I have to tell you, I would be remiss if I don't give a shout out to Barbara Ellis and Brian Russell. Barbara, you know you have a special place in my heart and you know um, your dear husband who um, passed away and he will always be in my heart and all our hearts. Um, you guys were the first ones who supported our homeless students fund that Trustee Baxter and I started. And um, you know, I can't help but tell you that this, it was very special to see your face in our first inaugural fundraiser, and it means a lot. And uh, same goes for you, Brian. Brian sits on our community task force, and he's been tremendous and a great asset. And thank you so much for all of your services, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to um, ask, 
do you do a direct ask for our homeless students? Because in my viewpoint, and in, I believe it's a shared sentiment, that's the most imminent issue that we're facing at the college as uh, at least one out of 10 of our students are facing homelessness. And uh, to me, that's not a college promise if we're not taking care of them. Um, and I want to know what kind of efforts and direct asks we're doing. I haven't heard it um, accentuated in the presentation, but I'm sure it's um, part of a larger c contribution. So if you can please touch on that, and I have a um, couple of other questions. Sure. Um, well, we're not doing a whole lot of direct asks around specific um, specific initiatives on campus right now because we... I thought you are doing College Promise. Well, we uh, are Direct doing, ask. Yeah. No, but we haven't actually sent out... I mean, if you're talking about like an annual fund appeal... No, I'm just like referring that. to your... Uh, you made a statement that there was a... You make a direct ask for a College Promise fund. Oh, so that was... Yeah, that was at the gala specifically. I see. But okay. I absolutely see... Um, I see the work that you and your committee are doing, Sunny, and it's so admirable... Um, I think this, as you know, like I said, we're looking to build out our database. We're looking to develop an annual fund, and I see that as an absolute um, initiative that we should be pushing forward. Okay, well, I'd certainly like to see a um, tangible report on that and what are some of the plans that you have in mind mm -hmm. or with your committee on that front. I know you do so much, so mm -hmm. I'm also proud to bring new members to the committee from the port. We have a lot of alumni, yes. and I'm always scouting them. Um, the new members that we brought are the executive director of the port, whose picture was uh, featured, and the now deputy executive director, and um, also our managing director of finance, so is higher than a C CFO position. So hopefully that's been helpful. Um, but I'm sure you're doing um, a great deal on the alumni outreach. And on that front, I wanted to ask, what are some of the things that you're doing on uh, on that end? And uh, how's it going on the alumni it's, outreach? So first, I just want to go back to your comment about the Board of Governors. And I want to thank you, you because you've been a wonderful partner, um, bringing in some really fabulous new board members. And I know you took a lot thank of time you. engaging them, introducing them to me, and developing those relationships. So I'm grateful for that, Sunny. It's my yeah, pleasure. Yeah, I hope we can continue that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, your question on alumni. So Jennifer would probably be the best person and Nancy to talk about this, but we have been making strides like in our alumni and there's so much more to go. We're operating off a very, very small group of people that have just kind of self-declared that they are alumni. So again, as we grow out this database, we will continue to expand our efforts. But we've had... Um, you know, we have we engage with them on a monthly basis through our newsletter. Um, and Jen, if you want to chime in, um, we would you like to come to the podium and uh, speak to the mic so we can have it on the I don't, record? You know, she wasn't prepared. Uh, we weren't pre you know, she I wasn't prepared. Because I want to make sure that, it's recorded. So. Um, but yeah, we've, you know, we host a graduation celebration at the rehearsal every year, and that's a good way of getting our new um, LBCC graduates engaged in the Alumni Association right away. Our students who graduate are given a free year of membership, so they're automatically members of the Alumni Association, and then they are only asked to pay a very nominal fee moving forward. We've also been working to expand the benefits. So really, I mean, our Alumni Association has been a very grassroots um, effort. It's changed hands across campus. So there's never really been anybody who's truly dedicated to this role in a full-time capacity. It's been, you know, Nancy was doing it 10 hours a week on top of all the other things she was doing. We've had different people on campus and it's just kind of changed hands. We are very thrilled to have the consistency now in the foundation and a full-time position to support this. Um, so the efforts have definitely increased and will continue to increase. Okay. So expanding those benefits that we provide to our members is, is, has been a focus as well. That's fantastic. Um, so last question that I have is on your, um, let's see, expenses for the gala. So I, uh, the so you we raised two hundred and thirteen thousand roughly or over 
the 213,000 and our expenses were over 155,000, correct? Mm -hmm. um, does that include staff salary expenses? Um, not specifically, no. So it doesn't include the salary of the individuals that were working that evening? It was a joint effort, um, so. What about your staff? No, I mean, it doesn't include salaries for staff that evening. Okay, but so, so the folks that were working that night, were they being paid or not? They were doing, pro how are we capturing those, um, those expenses? The, um, I, I can't comment on that right off the top of my head, but. Um, oh, okay, so isn't this what you guys put together? I mean, do you, do, what is the expense uh, captured? The expenses captured all of the actual um, expenses for the event. So we didn't track our own employee time. Okay, so it's more than 155,000 then, because employee time was, I mean, obviously we paid these folks, right? I'm, I didn't yeah, work those for that free, were not there on a volunteer basis, yes. So your staff was, were not getting paid? No, my staff were paid. Okay, so it's outside of this 155,000. Yeah, we track all of our, our um, our staff time is a different line item on our budget. It's tracked through salaries. Okay. So, all right. Thank you. That answers my question. So, this, the, if we were to capture the entire expenses, it's beyond the 155000 because of staff time. If we were taking the salaries into account, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This is a fabulous report. I personally, and I know the rest of the board, looks forward to getting these reoccurring updates and supporting you. And if there's anything we could do more better or different to better, you know, give it support, um, please tell us, you know, if there's any ideas you have tonight that you could share with us. We're all ears. Is there anything we could do more better or different? We love your support. And, Thank you. And Dr. Ramali has been coming up with some really good ideas. Yeah. We're working together and so we want to keep that going and if there's anything we can individually ask you to do we will do that and we'll do it and Vivian will be there to to hear what it is we need and maybe she can tell us oh the Board of Trustees can help with that so maybe task her with that well Vice President <laughs> Malo Ulu as we refer to her by her official designation, um, and the rest of the trustees here. Um, she is fantastic, and I'm sure she's gonna do a great job, much better than I did, because uh, it was during the time that I was working, so I'm sure she's gonna be a much more fabulous representative and will be able to support you. I do have to say that we are very lucky to have Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Without her, we wouldn't be here, so thank you so much, and thank you for your, all your effort and a great report. We now will move on to item 4.2, Athletics Team Impact, uh, Building Champions of Character. Presentation by uh, Randy Tutorp, Director of Athletics. This is also an informational item. We're, Randy will provide a brief background and description of our Athletics Building Champions program theme. In focusing on building champions of character, Randy will provide examples of ways in which the department is doing this and will show a short video of how we have partnered with Team Impact. Softball coach Amanda Megan Martinez will also be available to answer any questions. Um, if you could, oh, are you the softball coach? Awesome, welcome, thank you. Superintendent President Dr. Ramali, Board President Zia, members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to present to you tonight uh, and all those that have stayed uh, thus far. Megan, you could come back. I have to tell you, Megan's texting me the whole time saying, the, the person to the right of board, President Zia's daughter, is a beast at softball. She's really, really good. I, I, I just have to get, make a minor correction. I don't have a uh, daughter, and I believe you're uh, referring to vo uh, Vice President uh, Mala Ulu. Right. Sorry, to the right <laughs> Unless of. I'm not aware of a daughter that I don't No. <laughs> so... I'm going to get started. I just had to, I had to put that in there. It was, it was kind of fun. Um, since 1927, Long Beach City College has earned 92 state championships, more than any other California community college in the state. We can clap for that. That's, that's nice. <laughs> LBCC literally builds champions. We took this theme of building champions a couple of years ago and identified three ways uh, that we could target a department effort to intentionally 
accomplish this. So we focus on building champions in the classroom, in competition, and of character. Tonight, I'm going to share with you uh, the athletic department's goal of building champions of character and how we focus on volunteerism uh, or community support to accomplish this. So every year, each team uh, is provided or given the opportunity and expectation uh, to support some effort of volunteerism. And the ways that you're gonna see our teams get involved with this are generally uh, elementary school events. We get elementary schools reaching out to us for fit-a-thons, for Halloween themes, for various uh, events that they're holding on their campus uh, from the Long Beach Unified School District. And then we partner with them by coordinating uh, teams to go out and support these events and help with what's happening and what we find is that our student athletes during this process, um, I think because it's not that long ago that they were in elementary school, they're able to look at that and get that sense of, of volunteerism and we, that's part of what we wanna see. Uh, other ways that you see our student athletes involved is uh, food kitchens, food drives. Um, there, we've partnered with the Long Beach um, Boys and Girls Club on various events. There's been beach cleanups uh, currently our own Misty May trainer is working uh, with our LBCC Child Development Center uh, to coordinate uh, student athletes going in and reading uh, with and to uh, the, the, the children in the uh, center. Um, last year, and why Megan is here, our softball program really hit, uh, hit one out of the park. So Megan came to me and said, uh, you know, there's this opportunity with Team Impact uh, they, that I've been approached with and that I've been communicating with. And so I had to ask her, you know, what is, what is Team Impact? And so we researched it um, and we went through a, a contract process here with the district uh, to bring them on. Um, I think the best way rather than talk about it is to share a video that was prepared of our relationship with Team Impact uh, and what Megan did to bring this on board. So please direct your attention to the screen. It was a triple threat when the Long Beach City College Vikings teamed up with Team Impact to officially sign 11-year-old Elise Pineda to the Viking softball team to kick off their 2018 season. Elise, who was born with a gastrointestinal disorder, never thought she would be able to join a competitive team sport, but the LBCC Vikings have welcomed her with open arms and caring hearts through Team Impact. Since 2011, Team Impact has matched more than 1,400 children with more than 500 colleges and universities in 47 states, reaching over 35,000 participating student athletes. Here at Long Beach City College, uh, one of our program goals is to get our student athletes connected with our local community in a character building development and, and give back. So uh, we are excited to partner with Elise, with Team Impact, and to help with uh, uh, potential future Vikings in our area. The Lakewood native, who lives near Long Beach City College with her parents and two brothers, began practicing with the team in mid-January, earning the honor of throwing out the first pitch in the season home opener. So it's been very fortunate for her to be able to participate with the team and, you know, have this experience that she necessarily doesn't wouldn't be able to have an, um, due to her illness and so therefore she'll have the ability to have that team spirit and be belonging to part of a team without having to affect the outcome of a, of a game and so it, it really does uh, help her uh, be more confident and it encourages her to try different things in life that perhaps weren't always available uh, when she was younger. The following day, a large crowd of LBCC athletes, employees, and students cheered Elise on as head coach Megan Martinez presented her with an official letter of intent to play LBCC softball. I would like to say I'm very happy and excited that you have accepted me to be part of your team. You have given me a chance to experience something I didn't think would be possible. I am so thankful to be part of such a loving and encouraging team with great coaches. I will be very proud to wear red, black, and white. Go Vikings! As a team member, Elise will attend Viking practices, games, team dinners, events, and more, sure to form lifelong bonds with her teammates. 
Elise is our top recruit. We feel like she has a ton of energy. She's so knowledgeable about the game. She keeps us on our toes at practice. She runs the bases with us. Um, she makes sure that we're not slacking off and we're just so excited to have her around with us. On behalf of Long Beach City College, we welcome Elise Pineda to the Viking family. Go Vikings! Beautiful. You may want to stop that because it's going to go on autopilot and play the next video. <laughs> Thank you. I, I got to tell you, we have been doing uh, these types of volunteer acts and getting our student athletes and our teams involved in, in various uh, different opportunities. But this past year, the, what you saw and in every softball game during the season, seeing Elise out there, um, I think it, it just hit home with everybody and was really, I got to tell you, just one of the coolest things uh, we've done in a long time. And and it started with just kind of this push for each program to get involved. And then Coach Megan coming to me and saying, you know, I have this, this idea and this opportunity. Um, it's really cool. This is now also turned into a, an effort to try to get our football program uh, paired with Team Impact. So we're working on that right now to do something very similar with a different uh, young person uh, facing some, some difficulties. So uh, I'm excited about um, the program goals there. I'm excited to see these types of uh, opportunities for our student athletes and for our community. Uh, and very thankful for Megan uh, to bring this on board for Long Beach City College. And she's here, so I brought her because she was the expert with Elise all season. So we welcome any questions that you have. Okay, trustees, yes. Um, Vice President Malaulu. Uh, first of all, um, thank you, Randy, for accepting the call to give a presentation on behalf of the athletic department. Um, for Just to give you guys a heads up in the audience, I met with uh, Randy, and I thought this was going to be a one-meeting presentation, and he, you know, gosh, I'm going to spill the beans right now, but he's got this three-part series of presentations coming our way. So you definitely want to stay tuned because for the next couple of months, he's going to be highlighting a different component of our athletic department. And I appreciate that you kind of broke it down into bite-sized pieces. So today's is really neat. Coach Megan, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Um, I was actually at the event with Elise. I got there toward the end, and I was bawling at the end. So I can imagine what I would have, I would have been a disaster if I'd been there the Me whole too. time. Um, softball is very near and dear to my heart. I've got uh, my oldest daughter in the SEC and my youngest daughter committed to the pack. So we're just, Mississippi, UCLA. Yeah, <laughs> SEC in the pack. So it's just, um, I know all about that, you know, that, that red dirt at two o'clock in the morning scrubbing uniforms on those why do they make them white uniforms? We love softball moms. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Um, I, I also want to just, um, Randy, I know that this is focusing on Elise and team impact and, and athletics, but I just want to let you know that, you know, in preface to the rest of your presentations, the LBCC athletic department has always been a special place for my family too. We've got London, who's playing for Louisville, Ty, who right now is, is on his way for Rangers camp in Arizona, and these are my nephews, so I'm very, very, I'm a big fan of LBCC athletics, and I try to make as much as I can, and just keep up the great job. And Thank you, and we would love to have any more family members of yours come <laughs> to Long Beach City College. I'll shoot them this way. Thank you, but both of you, congratulations, and um, I know uh, the, my, my oldest daughter's travel ball team, this is their practice field. So USA Athletics Gold, they practice here. And then when my youngest daughter was little, this was her, her um, striker's soccer field. So I spent a lot of time at LBCC with the athletics program. I have a lot of love and respect for you and what you, you do, all of you. So thank you very much. I'm just glad that I'm not here on Saturday, Sunday mornings anymore. Because that was brutal. And, and I look forward to presenting on the other two pieces of how we're going to campus. In the classroom um, and in, as well in competition both of which need some data to come through. So I will work with uh, Jackie and uh, the board on future dates. Excellent, thank you, thank you. 
Other members of the board, yeah. uh, Trustee Otto. Yeah, uh, I, I especially appreciate that you started off by talking about the history of athletics at Long Beach City College because it is a storied history. We have won more championships than anybody else. And um, we have said for many years here on the board that the best learning community at Long Beach City College is the athletic programs because they make them come in, they make them get their homework done, they become good friends, they move on together, and it's a great foundation for uh, life. And you've done a, uh, you, we have done and you are doing a great job here. This was a very special presentation because it shows a different dimension of what it is that you guys do. And uh, uh, I, I'm just so impressed that uh, that you're expanding what you do and, and moving out of the community this way. I just have one real question, and that's, uh, what happened at Mount Sac last week? <laughs> do I have to answer that? <laughs> you have a right to remain silent. However, we do pass your budget. It, it was 100 degrees, <laughs> 1 o'clock, and I think some fogginess uh, on our brains. It was, if those of you that follow football uh, and Mount Sac, rivalry between Long Beach City College. Um, it's a great one. Um, our divisions changed this year, so that's good news. Yes. Uh, Mount Sac and Riverside uh, for a very long time has been in our division and a, a barrier, uh, so to speak, to a conference championship. Although we have been co-conference champs for the last three years, it's still become a playoff championship barrier and that the, the, our school, Riverside and Mount Sac, have been top five programs uh, the last five years. So it's very difficult when only four schools uh, in Southern California make it to playoffs. Um, that being said, the rivalry is fantastic. I think we're about split uh, over the last uh, four years, 50-50 on wins, and every time it comes down uh, to the last second. So uh, we were on the five-yard line with an opportunity to tie the game, uh, and we did not do it this year. Uh, we have had years where we have pulled that win out, uh, but Still always a good, good fight. Sorry, I didn't give you a real answer. <laughs> Trustee Antuk. Hey, uh, thank you so much for presenting tonight. Um, really appreciate your efforts and focus on ac academics within athletics. Uh, I'm a former student athlete. It's really, uh, you know, a great motivational tool for folks who may not uh, necessarily want to come to school sometimes and say, hey, you know, if you're not passing your classes, you're not getting your grades, you're not playing. Uh, and for some folks, it's really important. Uh, and, I, and I know, you know, kind of reading the body of research that, you know, this is one of our student success strategies as our athletic program, that they do better than the general student population. So it's, it's great to see that uh, focus and effort. And uh, I, 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 I was able to attend the student orientation uh, this past Monday, and I, uh, you brought up the Starfish early alert system. And I was, I was thinking of Dr. Scott of, uh, how, how scared some of the students looked, like, oh no, coach is gonna know, I didn't go to class. <laughs> you know, so it's great to see that you're using the tools that are being developed, and, uh, and I think it's gonna motivate uh, student athletes to, to do better and do more, because I, I shared with them that you're, you're our face everywhere you go. You, you, you brought it up of you're wearing the logo, the practice jersey around campus, it, all eyes are on you. And so it's, it's great that we're, we're focused on uh, the athletics and the academics. And, and I did go to the Grossmont game, and I saw that we did get that W. You know, I, th I think it was a, a fluke come from behind Mount Sac victory that, uh, you know, last Saturday. It was a very hot and, di and long, difficult third quarter. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, I, I, I've been out there. And, uh, and then thank you. My, my daughter is a member of the, the women's soccer team, and, uh, she's, it's, uh, this is her chance to play college soccer. She transferred from uh, another university and she's really excited. I think she scored her first goal this week. Uh, but she's like, man, they keep making me go see the counselor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, it's great feedback, you know, uh, as a parent to make, to hear that you're, you're staying on them and helping encourage the, the academics. So thank you again for all you're doing. Thank you, Trustee Antuck. And thank you, Randy, and, um, your awesome, um, uh, co-captain, the Batman and Robin team, Amanda. I really appreciate what you have uh, presented here. It was so fabulous. This is the kind of stuff that is the human part of what we do and the outreach, and it's just amazing. Keep it up. The world needs more love and joy, and I'm glad that we are doing our part in spreading it. So thank you for all that you do. I look forward to getting your sequel reports. Um, I know you have... Uh, 
uh, told me you're gonna teach me about football, so I'm still I'm still in the rookie stage. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'll learn uh, by the time the games are. <laughs> we we are planning. Us. So I like to plug too. If Liz is still here, uh, we are planning a management association um, VIB type uh, event w in conjunction with homecoming. So we would love, and I know the. All members of the board and exec got the special invite to attend some athletic events. Uh, but we would love for you to uh, identify that uh, game uh, and come out, and, and maybe we could do some um, instruction on, uh, on football. So. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we will now move on to the consent calendar. Um, we uh, Let's see. I didn't hear any... Um, any items wanting you know, to be pulled out? Um, so uh, do we have a motion for the consent agenda? Move approval. Is there a second? second. All right, Madam Secretary. So uh, moved by Trustee Otto and seconded by Trustee Intuk. Have it reversed. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwakjo Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And Student Trustee Jones? Aye. Um, so I know we had um, this, inc this excludes item 5, uh, 15 and 516 for a student trustee. So um, I, I just wanted to just take a brief moment, and um, we have our wonderful. Um, Foundation supporters, I apologize. I failed. To, I wanted to have us take a picture with you. I saw you guys um, outside, and it um, uh, looks like some of you didn't want to necessarily be in the picture, but I'm glad our superstars are here who want to take a picture. If, that, if that's okay with you all, uh, we want to take a picture of you with you, and thank you for your supporters. I see John and Barbara and um, Rick Dury and also Summer Temple, so uh, along with uh, great Aaron Moore. So if we can take a picture with you and, our, and the executive director, Liz McCann, that would be fabulous. All right, is everybody ready? All right, we will now move to item 6.1, 2017-2018 uh, CCFS 311 Annual Financial and Budget Report, including the 2018-2019 appropriations um, limit. 
This is an action item that the Board of Trustees uh, approved the 2017-18 CCFS 311 Annual Financial and Budget Report, including the 2018-2019 Appropriations Limit of the Long Beach Community College District and authorized transmittal of the report to the Chancellor's Office, California Community Colleges, as submitted. The CCFS 311 Annual Financial and Budget Report provides required financial information about fiscal year 2017-18 expenditures on audited in the fiscal year 2018-2019 uh, adopted budget. California Court of Regulations Title V, Section 58305D requires California's community college districts to prepare an annual statement of revenues and expenditures. The CCFS 311 report satisfies this requirement. Under Article 13B of the California State Constitution, Chapter 1205, Statute of 1980, all community colleges are required to com compute an annual appropriations limit. This limit, first established in 1978-79, is the maximum apportionment the district is allowed to receive from the state. Each year, the limit is recomputed by taking the prior year and adjusting it for changes in FTES. The district's apportionment limit for 2018-19 is 141 144,560,490. The appropriations which are subject to the limits are $111,466,261 and our calculus total expected revenues minus federal mandates. Therefore, the district appropri appropriations for 2018-2019 are below the apportionment limits. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion made by Trustee Antic. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President Malauulu. Um, is there a report or are we going to, I think we, we've received the report. Is there any, are there any questions, comments on this? Are we going to have a presentation? This is the report. I believe the re presentation is uh, 6.2. Oh, yeah. so. so. Um, okay, let's go ahead and take a vote. Vivian Malauulu. Aye. Uduwakjo Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones. Aye. Okay, item 6.2, 2018-2019 ad Adopted Budget and Education Protection uh, Account Expenditure Plan. This is an action we will be taking. The Board of Trustees approved the adopted budget for 2018-2019 and approved the use of the estimated 16,531,103 of 2018-19 Education Protection Account, APA, uh, proceeds resulting from the passage of Proposition 30 and 55 to partially fund instructional salaries and benefits as submitted. Do I have a motion? Moved by Trustee Intuk. Is there a second? Second by Vice President Malauulu. Um, okay, I believe we have a presentation on this front, or are we yes. going to start off with uh, Vice President uh, Dunn? Are you going to give the presentation? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, before I start, I would like to express my appreciation for all the members of the Budget Advisory Committee, and uh, particular appreciation for Mr. John Thompson, of, uh, Director of Fiscal Services, and his staff for their incredible efforts over the course of the summer to not only close the books, but to help create the budget. Um, it is labor intensive, happens behind the scene, and um, they do a fantastic job. With that, I'd like to present to you the 2018-19 adopted budget. Um, I'm going to give you a, an overview, discuss how the budget is aligned with board goals, talk about our assumptions, which are the meat of the budget, um, with our FTES history and projection, and then talk about the entire budget. Um, my presentation is going to focus on the unrestricted general fund. You'll see a couple of slides that show the entirety of the budget, but really the meat of our general operations is contained in the unrestricted general fund. First, a little bit about the state budget. And one disclaimer, that while the budget is fully enacted, not all trailer legislation has yet been signed by the governor. 
As you know, the budget contains the appropriations, trailer legislation contains policy implementation, and so there are a few things that we're going to talk about that are actually still yet to be cemented. Having said that, um, we were really pleased to receive an ongoing COLA as part of our budget. Um, I provided you with a pretty in-depth presentation in a previous meeting regarding the student-centered funding formula and that its impact on our district. Um, the ongoing COLA does represent $3.2 million in 2018-19. That is ongoing. Um, at the state level, it, uh, $104 million was appropriated for hold harmless districts, of which we are one, meaning that we will be paid based on our 2017-18 levels. In addition, we have a combined $140 million for transition to the new formula and apportionment of those funds. I'm going to just briefly overview the funding formula as I discussed, we uh, mentioned it in prior years. The most relevant piece of information I can give you is that as a hold harmless district, we will be receiving funding in this year equal to what we received in 1718 as increased by the COLA and in 1920 as increased by the next COLA and in 2021 as increased by the next COLA, providing with us with three years stable funding before we are actually funded on the formula in 2021-22. Due to uh, Dr. Ramar, Ramali's uh, advocacy, we do get that ongoing funding. We do have a three-year hold harmless, and the summer shift continues. Um, I will share that the summer shift becomes less relevant as we move to a three-year rolling average, and we'll have a couple of slides coming up talking about that. Some of the other components of the state budget included uh, $2.8 million for some specific categorical programs, including the COLA. Um, the COLA was also applied to adult education. We did have uh, disappointing news in the area of deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. Our um, anticipated share of this pot of money as of the May revise was about four times the amount we eventually received. We received just under $500,000. Originally, we were going to split this amount 70% for deferred maintenance, 30% for instructional equipment, but when we received just under um, half a million dollars, we decided that for it to truly have an impact, and due to Dr. Scott's um, request and his her representation of faculty needs, we have decided that 100% of that amount should go for instructional equipment to truly have an impact. Um, we are happy that the implementation of the College Promise, AB 19, was approved and we will be receiving about $848,000 of that to continue to augment what we've already done thus far under the College Promise. And uh, $40.7 million for full-time student success grant and the completion grant. Also very happy to share that we had two buildings approved for funding representing a total of about $30 million for us. This funding means that our bond program will have $30 million more for yet to be identified projects. So in our facilities plan, we did not anticipate the receipt of state funding because it is very preliminary. And so anytime we do get state funding, that means our bond program can do that much more. The state did consolidate three programs. Um, we are currently operating those programs as distinct programs as are almost all other uh, districts. I can't think of one that has consolidated it. It is the first year of the consolidation, and as we move forward, um, the plan is to address changes as necessary. And then, as you know, $120 million was appropriated at the state level for the online, California Online Community College. The next few slides show 
the alignment of our budget with trustee goals and our strategic plan. And that is important that as we develop the budget, it is always in alignment and to support those goals and priorities. Excuse me. Sure. Th these are the 2017-18 goals? Correct. These are the goals that had been established. Um, as the board establishes new goals, the budget will continue to be lined with the most recently established goals. Mm -hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, slide 11 shows that these are the goals approved on August 22nd, 2017. Um, the slides beginning on uh, slide 14 do the best job, I believe, is of illustrating that alignment and identifying those goals. I, I, I'm sorry. Certainly. I the, the Board of Trustee goals that were adopted were last year's goals. In slide 11, the strategic plan goals aren't the trustee goals. Those are different goals. You said those were adopted in, on August 22nd, but those are different goals. Thank you for the clarification. What we attempt to do with the budget is identify all those separate sets of goals. Of course. And that, then we align the budget as best we can to support those goals. College strategic plan, the board goals drive the budget. Right. No, but I'm, I just wanted to. Excuse me, Trustee Otto, please speak through the chair. Um, and if you could please um, let, let the vice president finish her presentation and reserve your questions towards the end. Um, that way we can go with velocity. I'd appreciate that. It's go ahead, uh, Marlene. Excuse me, could I, could I just ask one question? Sure. Sure. So I, I, I wanted to be clear that we haven't established our ongoing goals for the next year. And so these were last year's goals. And so we, the, the ones that we've got here that you're talking about are the Board of Trustees goals from last year, the strategic plan goals, which were adopted last year but are, are still operative. And then I, I've always wondered the institutional priorities, where do those come from? How are those are adopted? Institutional priorities are also developed through the Budget Advisory Committee as well as to align with any new um, state programs. So it's important to know that there are several different dynamic factors in the budget development. And so we um, obviously have to reflect expenditures that are in alignment with state laws and regulations um, as well as with those most recently adopted board goals and the strategic plan. Um, it is a balancing act, um, but I think that uh, through the different stakeholders, we are able to really create a, a solid budget. And we will be setting our board goals in our retreat, so um, you, you didn't have those, so you're doing fine. Great. Go ahead, proceed. Thank you. And so again, beginning on 14, I think we have a really great visual representation of how each of the components of our budget align with each of those various plans and goals. And please let me know if you want me to stop and go in depth on any one of those slides. I just want to recognize the time frame. I, I just ask that we finish your presentation and if trustees can Sorry. hold off till the end just because you know this can get pretty unwieldy. You got it. Thank you, I appreciate everyone's support on this. Slide 17 um, really shows a lot of the meat of how we do our projections. Um, obviously, accurate projections leads to a more accurate budget. Um, and through the Budget Advisory Committee, we do adopt some um, budget assumptions, including our target for FTS of 20,133, and you'll find that that is our 2016-17 level. Um, we always include a half a percent deficit factor on state revenues because historically, when the state does not have a sufficient appropriation to fund all districts, they do apply a deficit factor. So from a conservative standpoint, we must include that. And we use a total cost of ownership approach to planning and budgeting. Um, 
we must maintain a 5.5% minimum unrestricted reserve, but I will also share that our goal is actually 15%. That reflects, in um, my mind, a minimum level that's sufficient for us to move forward and to manage any potential uh, economic uncertainties. I would even go further and say that as we look forward to one more year will put us at a record-setting economic growth that means eventually there will be a recession and to consider establishing a specific assignment of fund balance reserves for economic uncertainties and as we continue our conversations I'd like to bring that back but currently we must have a five and a half percent minimum reserve but our goal is 15 percent and I'll be demonstrating for you where we land on that in just a couple slides. Other major assumptions include the increase in STRS and PERS, that when we look at the combined increase, that is a 1.3% increase based on our total salaries and benefits in 1819 alone. Um, our required contribution for retiree benefits is just a little over $4 million, and our health and welfare premiums are projected to increase by 2.5%. This is a new presentation of our FTES for you. That what we attempted to do is really give you a comparison of not just what our funded FTES is, because that is shifted every year from whether we're doing the summer shift or not. And that is what you're seeing in the blue column. But also to provide you what our actual FTES would be if we did not do the summer shift. And that can give you, I think, a better comparison of where we actually are. So we've talked before about in our funded FTES that we had a decline of about 2,000. But when you look at what our total is without doing the um, summer shift, it's closer to 300, 300. So it gives you different context in which to view that data. On slide 20, I do show you all of our funds. As I mentioned, the unrestricted general funds where most of our activity um, occurs. A great amount of activity also occurs in the restricted general fund. That's going to include your categorical and grant programs. The remaining funds represent activity that's very specific and not included in day-to-day -day operations. I'll point out that our general obligation funds um, look like we have a great amount budgeted. We budget assuming complete issuance. Obviously, issuance of the voter approved amounts will take several years, and that is my one disclaimer when you look at that amount. So when you compare the nearly $900 million originally budgeted, the unaudited actuals for 2017-18 actually show $25 million, and that's our actual activity in those bond funds for those years. So when we look at our specific activity, um, I will share that I added a slide in here, and that's for the tentative budget for 2018-19, so that you can see the flow of the information from where we ended up in 1718, so what we discussed at our last budget presentation to what we're showing now. The change is from the unaudited actual to the adopted. I've provided the tentative just to provide you with a frame of reference. Um, you can see that happily in 2017-18, our budget ended up at just under, or a deficit rather, ended up at just under $300,000, which was a tremendous success um, compared to where we were originally budgeted. At our tentative budget, we projected a $6.7 million deficit for 1819, and we've already been able to reduce that in our adopted budget down to just over $3.5 million. So we are looking still at a significant deficit. However, just in the few months, we've been able to make incredible inroads into reducing that. This slide shows the sources of our funds. I prefer to look at them um, as 
pie charts, and I believe we do have some coming up in a couple of slides. Um, but you can see that the primary source of revenue for our district is through our state apportionment. Some of the differences in our revenue for 1819 um, is that we do have the ongoing COLA of just over $3 million. Um, we do not anticipate any FON penalty, and so that's an increase in our budget of about a half a million dollars. Um, we are anticipating a half a percent deficit factor again. Um, we will not change that until the end of the year when we know whether or not that will happen. And we do have a small recalculation. Um, in other state revenue, we are showing a decrease in our mandated cost revenue as well as a decrease in our state lottery revenue. Here are the pie charts for you. That you can see uh, graphically that 91% of our budget is from the state and our principal apportionment. And then you can see that that's made up of not just state funds. The EPA from Prop 30 all the revenues actually offset on a dollar to the dollar the state's contribution to us. So the state makes out from those monies, we actually do not, um, as well as property taxes and enrollment fees. And when we look at our expenditures, obviously our um, salaries and benefits are the greatest portion of our budget, um, but we do spend significant amounts in supplies, um, services, capital outlay, et cetera. Um, we were able to reduce our total expenditures um, by $3 million from our tentative budget to our adopted budget, which was significant. Some of the major changes is that we do have an increase of just under a half a million dollars because we have hired the eight new full-time faculty who you were introduced to tonight. Um, that is offset by a decrease in full-time salaries of 17 retirees related to our SERP. Um, we were able to use part-time adjunct faculty this year to fill the need. Our classified salaries, um, actually have no change, and that's after taking the benefit of savings from the SERP, but applying um, step and column and stirs and purse increases. Um, and for our total benefits, we do have an increase of two and a half million dollars related to step and column, stirs and purse, and health and welfare benefits. In contract services and operating expense, um, we do have a $1.2 million increase. And just as a little bit of context, we often have contracts that have not to exceed amounts and we have to budget at the not to exceed amount. At the end of the year, we actually show the true cost. And this $1.2 million really reflects the change from a true cost in 1718 to this budgeting for the not to exceed amount. And phase two of our deficit reduction plan is to examine each and every one of these contracts to determine if it is still needed and if it is the most cost effective way to achieve that need. And so here you can see um, where we fall with the use of our um, different expenditure um, pieces. I'm going to talk about that salaries and benefits percentage in just another slide. And this is the slide. Um, when I shared with your deficit reduction plan, you'll recall that I said that our salaries and benefits will be reduced to just over 87%. And you may be wondering why I'm showing you a number that is about 89.1%. The reason is some of those salary changes are being approached in steps that we are not affecting people, only positions. And so some of those changes involved not filling, for instance, a director. But in order to do that and to still accomplish our needs, we needed to raise a couple of positions up to a supervisor level. So we actually need to create that position fill that position, and then once we have a vacancy at a lower position, then eliminate that position. So we have to wait until we have that vacancy to eliminate it and reflect the budget savings in order not to affect people and only affect 
positions. So you will be seeing budget revisions as a result of that action as the year goes on and as we're able to accomplish it. And this chart does show historically that we have been around 90% salaries and benefits, and we do want to reduce that to 85%. Um, and we are making great inroads into getting closer to it. Our challenge is that as STRS and PERS contributions increase, it's difficult, and I'll be showing you some more information about that. So our projected reserve levels are despite our ongoing deficit reduction, we are projecting for 1819 a reserve level of 19.4%, which is important because that level of reserve allows us to manage in the next two out years as we have continuing deficit reduction. So we um, fall to 14.1% and then to 9.3% in 2020, 21. Our goal being to have 15% in all projected years. So that brings us to our future budget challenges that we do wanna reach 20,133 FTEs. Um, as the economy does better, declining enrollment is a problem for every community college in the state. Um, and we do need to react to the new student-centered funding formula. With STRS and PERS, the increases in our contributions will continue to rise in the out years. That the increase in STRS and PERS began in 2014-15. State law was passed that enacted increases in the STRS employer contribution rate in each year through 2022-23. It also included the intent for the PERS board to increase their rates as necessary to correct a $30 billion upside down problem with the STRS and PERS fund. It is true that employees also saw an increase in their rates. Those were leveled out after the first two years and they were minimal. It is also true that the state increased their contribution, but again, minimally. So you can see on this slide that by time we reach 22-23 STRS, we'll have more than doubled as we'll have PERS. The cost in 1819 to our district is two and a half million dollars. And the total column reflects the annual increase over the prior year. So by time we've gotten to the completion of the increase, the total annual increase will be almost $14 million to our district. Um, the continued deficit spending is clearly our largest um, budget challenge, but we are developing a rigorous deficit reduction plan to address that and to address combating the um, unavoidable increases we're faced with annually. Um, I do want to mention that out of the deficit spending, there is $1 million of one-time projects. So this is one instance of when deficit spending actually makes sense. So we have a savings from a prior year that we are going to be spending on improving systems and improving um, efficiencies. And obviously meeting those success metrics when we exit the hold harmless period for the funding formula is one of our primary concerns. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Vice President Dunn. Um, I, uh, Trustee Intook, I believe you had some questions. Yeah, uh, thank you for, so much for the presentation. And I had a, a ch chance to speak with you briefly uh, last week about the budget and it's um, I think important a very important document <laughs> and process. A um, few things. On the reserves number, I think I got my math added up. So 22.9% was last year, which was about 30 million. And then our, our projected is 19. But right. We want to go down to 15. The way we project our reserve percentage is total expenditures. Um, so that's our budget. So our ending balance is a percentage of our total expenditures. So we do have a relationship from the prior year, but as our expenditures change, 
what that reserve means as a percentage is dependent on that year's expenditures. So it did decline by both virtue of um, last year's small deficit as well as the projected deficit in 1819. So what, 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 was, what was the actual fund balance from last year to this year for our reserves? in a dollar amount, not a percent. So when we, um, as a dollar amount, our 1718 unaudited actuals ended up with $30.2 million with a um, reserve percentage of 22.9%. Okay. That's what I calculated, but I just do it on my iPhone. Um, <laughs> other um, question is on the um, student equity dollars, which I think is in restricted balance or general restricted, restricted general fund. What is that uh, amount and how's that broken out? I know it's, they're going now to block grants for this current year or is that for next year, that shift? Um, I'm going to defer to, um, to Dr. Munoz to address the student equity budget. Um, I will say that it is contained within the restricted general fund um, and the rules for the expenditures of those funds, as always, are dependent upon the state's enactment of um, statute and regulation. Yes, so as an update, prior in prior years before the consolidated block grant, Triple SP Student Success Support Program, both credit and non-credit, basic skills initiative, and student equity funds were th four standalone budgets. Um, in this new budget, they've been consolidated into a new block grant, which is now called Student Equity Achievement Program. So with the consolidated, what essentially the Chancellor's Office did is took all of the 17, 18 allocations for those four budgets and level funded us at a kind of a no hold harmless. So they, they essentially everything that we were funded in those four budgets in 17, 18, we, you add those together and that was our allocation for 18, 19. And so what we did, given that this was new um, legislation, or as well as given the fact that many of the programs had already um, developed their budgets for this year, we opted to kind of just roll over the previous year's budget allocation to the four programs and we'll maintain those four programs this current year um, with the four allocations that they had in the previous year. Um, what that means though moving forward is we will be kind of taking this year to convene the stakeholders to really determine what the strategy will be for 1920 and beyond now that it is a consolidated block grant. With, with that new strategy, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess it gives us more flexibility. We could spend more money on one or the other or a third. Um, how is the public included in that process if community groups or uh, members of the public wanted to weigh in and say, well, maybe we think more money should be spent on t tutoring, uh, but whether or not we, you know, adopt it or not, but at least uh, sure. public input and in the change in that process. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still somewhat new at the college, so I'm going to share my understanding, and then at any time something needs to be corrected, feel free to weigh in. But um, we do have the Student Success Committee that is a college governance committee that brings together pretty much all of these categorical programs. So you have representatives from both Student Equity, Triple SP, um, Basic Skills Initiative, as well as other initiatives such as Strong Workforce, um, as well as, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Adult Ed. Uh, Adult Ed, Ed, Ed ed Education Block Grant, as well as the um, Pathways, the um, Promise Pathways group. So that is probably going to be the venue in which we would seek input from in terms of uh, building the budget. Now recognize that from a governance standpoint, when you look at the charges um, from the planning kind of forms and documents that we have, typically budgets are not embedded within the charge of these committees, but in a college environment where we do want to engage stakeholders, we would probably use that vehicle to seek input as we develop these budgets. So that would, that's essentially the pro, um, proposal that would probably be put forward in terms of the opportunity to seek input. 
Yeah, our shared governance bodies review. They don't have budget authority per se. They make budget recommendations. So what they do is they take a look at things that have been effective in the past and make recommendations as to how they want to move the dial in the future. And then what we, the administration, do is evaluate that and then do an ROI and the things that can, where we can do an ROI and try to shove the money in the, in the areas where it moves the dial the most. Um, which is why you're going to see a lot of money put into supplemental instruction this year, specifically for the math center and for the Alex software, because we know that that has proven data that's come out of nationwide research, as well as through the Cal State system, where it dramatically moves the dial for people of color. So you'll see each year it tweak just a little bit as to where we find it having been the most effective. Great. And, and, and I guess those committees and even the statute and requirements are on-campus people are, are primarily involved, but mm -hmm. we've not had a, a community participation. One of the things I, I guess I'm leading to is uh, we've done a lot in the city of Long Beach uh, participatory budgeting, uh, where you know we, we, the community got a, an idea to learn what the process is, see where money's being spent, and have a say or a vote. Yeah, we like this or we don't like that. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes you find out people vote the same way you're already deciding. Uh, but it would be interesting because I. I'm not aware of us going off site as far as engaging the community on like a budget workshop or how equity dollars are being spent, which is uh, really touches the, the majority of Long Beach population and uh, falls in that category. I think that's a great idea. And just to, I, mean, I didn't, I failed to mention this, but as part of it, this is separate from the budgetary process, but we will have to revise our student equity plan. It will be due December 2019. Um, so we have some time, some leeway time. So if there is a desire to include community engagement in the development of our student equity plan, we can make that, um, those adjustments as needed if that's the, the will of the board or, or the superintendent president, I think we'd be open to that as well, Dr. And two, two last items. Um, as we're doing this, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I have two engineering degrees, and I can uh, do the math on my iPhone. Don't apologize <laughs> for it. <laughs> well, you know, it's a... Uh, it's a great it honor would, to have engineering degrees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be great if there was a slimmed-down community version of the budget or a student version of the budget that yeah. just gives a straight income and expense you know, break down, you know, highlights that something that we could share because it's, I mean, you know, 90 page document, 45 page documents uh, are, are quite difficult to, to try to translate to the everyday person. And I think the more we can, can figure out how to make it bite sized uh, and, and relatable, uh, people will, you know, continue to buy in and support the college when they see how we're spending the money and the, you know, that we are investing in things that work uh, to move the dial. I, I think that would be great. Last thing is, um, you know, the, the concept of the rainy day fund um, is, you know, the state does it, the governor does it. Um, I don't know if, if we have already an account like that that I missed in the budget or if that's a process. I'm glad you brought that up. That's going to be the number one recommendation that I make coming out of this budget. I'm going to uh, strongly recommend that the board set aside a rainy day fund. Um, we knew in January of 2014 that the PERS and STIRS was upon us and we did not set aside money. And I think any time we budget, we want to learn the lessons from the past and, and correct anything that we learn the following year, each year. It's a, it's a iterative process. And one of the major lessons is to we, there's always a rainy day, whether it's PERS or STIRS, whether it's the recession, whether it's the cliff that we don't know if we'll make our enrollment back in three years, despite every college effort. Um, I believe, just like we all have savings accounts, um, I believe that we ought to have a legitimate rainy day fund savings account where we commit to putting X percent or X dollars away so that we don't put ourselves in this position again. Um, you know, five years out, there's always rain, and so I think it would be wise to have um, that type of a thing. That's going to be my number one recommendation come out, out of this year. Will that be a, a policy or that will come? back to the board? I think what we're going to do, or Marlene, uh, VP Dunn, and I will discuss how other districts do it. Um, I know one district in particular in January 2014 heard the news and immediately established a fund for Persinsters. And so I want to see, uh, a lot of districts did that, so I want to see how did they do it, um, were there policies around it, was, there, was it a percentage, was it a dollar amount, and see if we can take some best practices um, and bring that back to you. Great, with the thank you so much. That's great. Um, 
Superintendent President, Dr. Romali, I, I believe you're already on top of the recommendation that Trustee Intuk has uh, brought forward uh, for having a Reader's Digest or a more palatable version of the budget that was put out um, today. And I believe we have copies out for the members of public if they sh so choose to um, defer to it and um, go for seeing our very exciting and juicy budget numbers um, and, and a snapshot. So thank you for that great recommendation, Trustee Intuk. I know um, you uh, need to uh, leave, so um, I want to go back to Trustee Otto and make sure your questions were all answered. I apologize if I, um, I should have stated that in the beginning of the presentation to reserve the questions at the, towards the end. So would you like to speak, Trustee Otto? Great, thank you. Um, the, I don't know whether, uh, Vice President Dunn, whether you got a copy of this uh, one page, two sided document that was, I think, sent out earlier today, or at least I got it tonight. Um, this one? Okay. Do, do, you, do you have, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, yes, I do have the document. Okay. I, I don't know what it is, um, and could you? What, 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 first of all, what is it? It's, a, it's, it's got a lot of numbers, on, but it doesn't have a heading at the top of it. I'm looking at the back of it, and I'm trying to understand what it is. Can you take it? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, this is our internal document. Um, it's how we keep our notes and how we keep track of how we're going to budget for our equity funds. And so we look at how much did we spend last year. We look at what was most effective or what has been done, and we just don't need to do it because it's already <clears> been done and then how, what our actuals were, and then what we're projecting for this year, and the back is salaries that are attached to that. VP Munoz, do you have anything to add to that? Good, so is, so is, the, is this the back? No, that's the front. Okay, this is the front, okay, thanks. So what, can you, I, I didn't understand when I looked at, when I looked at the bottom of the front page, where it says total 2017-18 expenditures, it says projected for 1718 was 2,700,000 and some change. When the actual came in at 3 million, maybe didn't, I don't mean came in, but, but it says 3.6 3, 3, 3. million. And I, I don't understand what, what, that, what it means. So. so that number includes the carryover from the previous year. So if you look at the top of the budget, you can see that there was some about $1.3 million in rollover from the previous fiscal year. And so the, um, when, and just to give us some historical backdrop, when these funds were released to colleges, this is a fairly new program that started about two or three years ago. Many colleges had substantial amounts of carryover moving from um, one fiscal year to the next because we were figuring out and organizing ourselves to determine how best to leverage these student equity dollars. So the Chancellor's Office essentially gave us an additional um, one year or 12 months to spend the $1.3 million carryover from the previous year. So there, that explains why um, we spent over because we were spending our 17-18 um, allocation and the remaining 1.3 million from the 16-17 allocation. That, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, the when we did our enrollment management plan a year ago, we said that um, that was going to be the way that we were going to address the uh, uh, enrollment issue. And I remember at that time, this is, a, I think, literally when we were doing the budget last year. And um, I know I said at that time, how will we know how we're doing over the course of the next year? And I still don't know um, exactly how we're doing. I've, we've got a, a ton of information here, and I, and I uh, understand that. But um, I know we've got a plan, and... Um, and, and yet what we got hit with between then and now is a new funding formula uh, from the state. And at least in the first year, it's 70% of of, for base allocation, basically, FTES, then 20% for equity and 10% for student success. Do we have specific plans for achieving what we need to achieve to meet those? Yes. You don't have, you have to great, go over all of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we definitely do have definitive plans on how we're going to achieve that. That's a great point. 
Um, we presented the board with a 70-page return on investment document that went over the various ROIs. However, the funding formula has changed. So uh, Dean Heather Van Volkenberg and her IE team is updating that to kind of reflect where are we now because some of our priorities are changing. Um, for example, uh, at the October board, you're going to see I get these certificates um, come through, GE certificates come through to, not that we weren't focused on completion before, but we're even doubling down. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of information coming through in October and November, which is kind of a refresher based on the new funding formula. How have we had to redirect some thinking? How have we tried to double down on things like completion and enrollment? Um, so I think um, that's a very, very well taken. Okay. And if I may add that for this year and the following two years, our revenue is not based on our actual FTES count. It is rather the 1718 level. So it does give us a, give us a, a small amount of time to be able to make those. Um, and, and am I correct in thinking that because it's a three year hold harmless that we have three years or is it, have they just set it out for the first two years and it remains to be determined? how they're going to do it for the third year. It is for three years. So in 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021, we do know exactly what our revenue will be. Um, if the coal is that were projected hold firm, the coal is are not uh, finalized until May of each year. Uh, but otherwise, that is our, um, our floor. If we do exceptionally well and build our enrollment and have completions and the actual calculation says we get more money, we would get the more money. But we will not get anything less than that 17, 18 level increase by the COLA. Is it possible for us to know uh, on a year to year basis, and I'm obviously just thinking about the next year, how we did against if we didn't have hold harmless? In other words, if mm -hmm. we weren't given if we weren't being given what we were given this last year, are we able to say, okay, if we weren't given it, here's where we stand with regard to these things? Because it seems to me that that might be an interesting met metric to, to, to be able to see how we're doing against that. Yes. We've um, actually walked through that exercise um, knowing first that the chancellor's office has only released the calculation for 1819. And so we've attempted to take that calculation and push it out for several years, doing our best ability to interpret the legislation. Mm -hmm. So there's a great amount of assumptions built into it. But we've gone through that exercise, and we've also gone through the exercise using our targets of maintaining our FTES at 20,000 roughly and hin hitting the increases that Dr. Munoz and Dr. Scott feel that we can do um, and seeing where we land in that fourth year. Um, and so that is really guiding our conversations and the development of um, some of those goals and how we need to hone in in some of the performance areas. Uh, for example, uh, do we have any sense now, or when, maybe the better question is, when will we have a sense of how we've done year to year, fall semester in terms of enrollment? Because I know we've had an enrollment management plan in place now for about a year. It's only a couple of weeks, so. I don't think that's enough time to know what our enrollment's going to be, but do we have any sense of when? And um, I think I need to go back and take a look and see when our fall enrollment really hits that steady level to be able to come back to you and tell you this is the moment. Um, and that's when we'd definitely be able to look at the fall, and then we would need to go through the exercise again for the spring. Um, but I believe that um, right now it's still a preliminary number and, and could we know it for last spring uh, how we did as opposed to the previous spring uh, whether, whether we're up or down or certainly certainly we can um, produce I know the enrollment management plan it was just getting started so mm -hmm. so I don't know and you know I, I don't think I mean we all these things can be taken into consideration but I'm I think as as board members we have a responsibility to look at these things and make sure that we're physically prudent and and uh, and doing what it is that we should but the most important thing is to get what it is to get an understanding of of what the situation is and we need numbers to do that and let me jump around a little bit because I have I no add a couple that's a very good question I just want to one thing I forgot to say that's a very good question 
Um, I get very nervous when I go to a conference or a meeting recently and hear from other superintendents how they are dramatically down. All of our neighbors are dramatically down. That makes me very nervous. Um, hence the rainy day fund. Um, I did ask uh, Dean Van Volkenberg in IE to create a scorecard mm -hmm. um, where each year we see how did we do on the goals and what are the trend patterns. They uh, are telling me that they have it in draft, so I'm eager to see where they stand on that and does it tell us the things that we need to know. Um, it'll tell us you know, how we're doing on the enrollment management plan or are we doing as best as can be expected? Could we do better? Um, and then where we need to make any shifts. It'll also tell us how to predict if we're gonna make it in three years or not. And if we're not, then hence the rainy day fund, we need to be planning now. We know three, we have three years out, we can push everything we've got it and hopefully make it, our plan is to make it. But if we don't, we, need, we must uh, be conservative and be ready. Yeah. You're absolutely okay. right. No, that's, <clears throat> that's great. <clears throat> so, excuse me, um, jumping around just a little bit, I, I, I heard for the first time tonight that we had made it, what sounds to me to be a wise decision to allocate 100% of the money that we got for, for maintenance inst and instructional uh, equipment to instructional equipment. Um, does that do anything significant to a deferred maintenance program that we had, or should we be worried about that? Or I, I, I just don't know, but I suspect not. I think it was a good decision. We certainly would have been able to use the deferred maintenance money at the level that was proposed in May in the May revise, that we have that level of facility needs for deferred maintenance. And just to define, deferred maintenance is um, regular routine maintenance on our buildings that's beyond just the day-to-day -day maintenance. So it's not the level of modernization that we would use bond fund for. Right. Um, the reality is that at less than half a million dollars, it was not significant for our needs, but it was significant for instructional equipment. And so by um, gotcha. allowing it to be used there, we really got more bang for our buck. Um, that does not mean that we're ignoring our maintenance needs. It just means that we are accepting that we need to fund them from a different source. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the two, we, 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 we talked about that we've got two projects that are now funded. You know, I mean, I was in the meetings with uh, uh, the Department of Finance last year. There are 15 shovel-ready projects uh, that, uh, that were in, in the state, and the governor, in his wisdom, decided to fund only a few of them. Uh, and we got two of them last year. So my question is, did we get any more this year? Or are these just the same two that we got and the $30 million that we got were money that we were gonna get anyway because that was added. We still have the same number of pent up, the same amount of pent up demand for the projects that the state architect is involved with that we need to do. It is correct that it is the same too. It's a multi-year approach in the approval process. So you get a preliminary approval and that, that provides you with the opportunity to get more in depth on your planning and then you go back and you wanna get the next level and that's what this represents is the funding for these projects. It is final, final. Um, we certainly have more projects for which we have put an application in the hopper. Um, the next fiscal year at the state level will be interesting because we will have a new governor. Um, and I don't think it's a secret that uh, Governor Brown was in opposition of the state bond and had a delay in the allocation of those funds. So it will be interesting. Um, I will also share that there have been a record number of bond approvals statewide, and so that means we have competition. Um, but again, our, faci our 2041 facility plan does not anticipate state funding, so we can accomplish all of our goals, but every time we get state funding, that means we get to have something else, which is a fantastic place to be in. Right. Good. And then under the, the uh, budget assumptions, um, we, um, we, we arrived at the, uh, the, the figure of 20,133 full-time equivalent students next year. How did we get that? Was it driven by that's what we needed to get to get the money or was it, 
How did we get to that number? We got to that number because that's our actual 2016-17 FTES level. What we wanted to do was to restore the loss from 16-17 to 17-18, um, recognizing that during the hold harmless period, our actual FTES doesn't drive our revenue. It certainly drives lottery revenue. It drives a mandated block grant revenue. Um, but it doesn't drive our general source of revenue. But what we are doing is developing a plan to recover the enrollment and to start to build it as reasonable in our final um, approach to when we are actually funded under the um, state funding formula. I know that it's harder than it used to be because the competition is more intense because high school graduation rates are down and uh, uh, co colleges all around us are competing with us for the same students. That's why it's been so uh, uh, great that we've gone out to ABC and Linwood and other places to try and get their interest in coming to Long Beach City College. Um, is there a way that we're tracking how successful we are in those partnerships. I know it's at the very beginning, so there wouldn't be any information yet. But uh, is that built into how we're doing doing things? Because I, again, I, you know, we're we're doing this at a policy thirty thousand feet level or ten thousand foot level. Uh, and so we don't know on a regular basis where we are. Yeah, we are establishing our baseline, our benchmarks for all of these initiatives. So using ABC and Linwood as an example, uh, when we met with them, we knew exactly how many of our students right now come from those districts, and that allows us to see what impact we have from further partnerships with them. And that's true for each of these initiatives as we identify them. Okay. Um. <clears throat> The, um, the thing that I still have trouble wrapping my mind around is what we're doing with our business review processes. I know that we started it. We did um, some things. Uh, didn't finish some things that we started, I think. There are some other things that we're expected to do, but I don't know, are those dedicated funds or could those funds be used for something else because we've got things that we need to do in the future and I, d I just don't understand the status of it. That sounds like something we could perhaps bring a report back. On. Yeah, absolutely. Give us more detail. Okay. Oops. Was that all? Um, just the other? Pardon? Was that all? No. Um, the... Um, so, but, but what we're doing, what it says in our report is we're going to carry over those monies, those, is it 3.4 million? Correct. Uh, to next year, um, uh, and we're going to look and see what it is that, that we can do. I mean, I, I, even things that I think that we've spent money on, uh, we could spend more money on because we apparently didn't solve the problems with the money that we spent, and, uh, so that we're, we're still open for that, Can, but, but I mean, is it, do, do we need to get back on the issue of whether we could spend it on other things? If I can share what we are doing with the BPRs is taking a very strategic look at what we need to improve and how to best allocate those funds and have that effort in a way that has the greatest impact. Um, we're starting that with an analysis of what had been attempted, how far we got, and then determining and identifying our greatest priorities um, that we do have need for improved processes and need for uh, efficiencies, but I think that we can better come back to you at a future point with the progress we've made on um, setting those priorities. Yeah, it's a good question. When Marlene, uh, Vice President Dunn first got here, I asked her to look at the BPRs based on her fresh set of eyes, what worked, what didn't, what did we learn from it, and that based on the completely new funding formula and the ways we ha and the new enrollment management plan, and now we have more data available to us as to what's working and what's not, do we need a fresh set of eyes at it? And she's been doing a good job with that, so uh, it would be a good time, I think, this also to give an update. Absolutely. Our world has changed, so our needs have changed almost overnight, and so we need to be responsive to that.
I understand that. Um, on slide 29, um, it was a little confusing. I think I understand it, but I'm not sure when it talks to about the uh, surplus or deficit uh, that uh, out of the general fund, um, it shows that in from 2012-13 through 2016-17, there was no deficit. Uh, there was a surplus, um, but with this last year, we're running this small surplus, and then we anticipate a $3.6 million deficit in the newly adopted budget. Is that accurate? Yes. Um it's interesting to note that for 1617, with the adopted budget, there was actually a small deficit projected in that year, too. And the budget is truly a living document that we have an opportunity to project that if we don't make adjustments, this is our ending point. And I believe 1718 was a good example of how that can be successful. That with the tentative 1718 budget, we projected a $10.7 million deficit. And we ended up with something closer to only $300,000. And that's with a continued focus and purpose um, strategically to affect a reduction in expenditures in a way that does not affect students or programs. Um, some of it is natural. It is always, it's, it's a fact that you will always end the year better than you project if you do your job right because you are not uh, projecting in a, a, an optimistic way. Um, budgets shouldn't be optimistic, they should be conservative. Um, but with our identification with the 1819 preliminary budget, we were able to say this is the size of our problem. And we did a lot of hard work over the summer and cut it in about half. Mm -hmm. The hard work will continue over the course of the year until we get as close to zero as humanly possible. So um, the, with, this is my last question about the business process review stuff. It, it, it seemed to me that if that was a pot of money that was available and there were arguments to use it for something like the strategic enrollment management plan because we need, we thought that there was some bang for the buck that we could get out of it either in uh, FTESs or something else that would give us what it is that we needed because as this new funding formula comes in, uh, you know, we're, we're, I think we're fine for three years, uh, but, uh, but we may know that, uh, we, we may know along the way that we may not be fine after three years. And that's why we're, we would want to shore up some things we possibly could. Absolutely. And then the, the last thing is really kind of a request, and that's just I talked to Trustee Udawak about this, and um, it seems that it would be a good idea to have a, uh, a, a trustee committee, not a standing committee, but a trustee committee to, uh, to work with um, you, uh, w w with the staff, to know what the metrics are so that we can know what it is that's happening. Uh, because we can't have, you know, two-hour reports every board meeting on what, what's going on. And by the way, it's certainly, the information isn't even available on a monthly basis. But because of our responsibility to know physically where we're at, uh, you know, I, I, I and he said he would be interested in doing something like that. I know the way that these committees are formed by, is by a consensus uh, of board members, but uh, I throw that out as an idea because uh, I think that if we're able to periodically work with you to see where we are, we, we, you know, we're, it, it, would, it would make it more understandable and I think we would be meeting our fiduciary responsibilities uh, uh, better. Thank you, Trustee Otto. Um, I um, would not uh, support having another committee. We have enough committees. And at any time, if you have questions, as you have been, you can ask our Vice President, uh, well, you can ask our Superintendent President, Dr. Ramali, um, and you can get the information. Uh, I don't think it's prudent, and I, I do think it runs a risk of micromanaging some of your comments. 
borders the line of how to manage these funds, and that's the operations of the district, and that's uh, under Superintendent President Dr. Romali's responsibilities. Um, Vice President Malauulu, excuse me. I think you must me, not think, have understood Excuse my me, uh, you're out of order. Uh, Vice President Malauulu, do you have any questions before we move on? Thank you, President Zia. I don't have a question. Um, I was able to get all of the answers to my questions uh, taken care of prior to the meeting. I do uh, have one comment. I just want to say thank you to the staff for uh, working so hard to make sure that the budget is reflective of not only our needs right now, but of our needs in the future, and that we're... Um, I mean, not we, we can't take credit as a board, but the staff really is doing all the work and all the corner cutting is um, prudent and it's helpful. And I also appreciate how hard uh, President Romali has worked with the funding formula and not only making sense of it, but just making it work for us because it's not a one size fits all funding formula. It's a very complicated, formula that, um, you know, you really have to work and cater to your own campus and your own district. So I appreciate that. Thank you both very much. And your team, because I know that you have a team that you work with in accounting. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Malauulu. I, too, want to echo um, your um, support and comments, um, and I can't say enough about what staff has done. You guys are doing a fantastic job. It isn't our job to dictate or prescribe to you how to do your jobs, and we have full confidence in you. Item 7.1 is the Academic Senate President Report. The Academic Senate President could not be... Um, oh, did we not... It was this, we need to did take we the not, vote. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, go ahead and call the vote. Secretary Vivian Han. Malauulu. Uruwak Joe Inta. Mm. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones. Aye. Item 7.1, um, Academic seven, uh, President is uh, not present tonight. Item 7.2, we will move on to Classify Senate President's report. Uh, Annie, if you'd like to. Sure. Thank Senate you very President. much, uh, Board of Trustee President uh, Zia. Um, I want to acknowledge that College Day was a great experience. Uh, I heard from a lot of Classify that they were very motivated and inspired and uh, are ready to at least try to fulfill the call to action that we made. Um, I also want to applaud the passing of the resolution for the LGBTQ um, History Month. I think it's very important and uh, to acknowledge all of our diverse uh, staff faculty, um, and students. So we appreciate that. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Classified Senate President uh, Engel. Um, Board of Trustees report 7.3, Vice President Malauulu, do you, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. I have a very brief report. I apologize that I'm, um, I don't know if I'm getting sick or I've just been sick a long time and been fighting it, but sorry, apologies for the way my voice sounds. Somebody on the phone earlier today said, thank you, sir. <laughs> so I'll take that. Um, I just want to welcome everybody back. Hopefully you've had a great start, lots of enthusiasm and energy that resulted, uh, that started, it stemmed at college day and hopefully will carry us throughout the rest of the semester and the year. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Also, um, I was able to attend the Welcome Back barbecues at both campuses, and it was fun seeing our students returning and new, um, serving up hot dogs, and just walking around campus. Um, I did notice that the lines were a little bit shorter than they normally are, and I am, but they're still there, and I'm hoping that we can soon, Dr. Romali, implement the text waiting program with the cell phones because you know we really have to get with the times and I know other colleges do that and I just hated walking around campus last week and seeing students and their families standing outside in the sun. Um, it's just you know we, we have to do what we can to get with that. And uh, the last thing is I just really want to again and again and again stress that we need to implement a communication system to uh, 
send out information specifically to students because again, I made it a point to ask the students I know on campus, they didn't know about the Welcome Back Barbecue. And this has been a problem for you know three or four years that they just don't know about it. So we need to send out emails and text messages and just figure out a way to really communicate with them. And it's been something that I've been asking for a couple of years. So maybe this will be the year that we make that happen. Other than that, welcome everybody and have a great year. Thank you. Trustee Baxter, as I mentioned earlier, is in the hospital and um, will be joining us soon. Trustee Intuk had to um, go on a flight for business that had to get rescheduled due to the hurricanes. Trustee Otto, would you like to give a report? Uh, just briefly, um, uh, I uh, got uh, hornswoggled into college day uh, by the superintendent president, uh, uh, which, was, uh, which, which I thought was very inspirational. The, the whole day was, and, uh, uh, and it was a good send off for the year. Uh, it's a very important year for Long Beach City College. It is uh, the beginning of a transition to a new way at looking at community colleges, not only because there's a new funding formula and we're gonna have to be adjusting to that eventually, uh, sooner probably rather than later, but there's also an online college that's coming on and uh, that may affect us as well. There's $100 million that's allocated for it with $20 million uh, of, of uh, follow-up. Uh, so uh, I, I know there's a lot of strong sentiment, particularly on the part of the faculty as expressed at the statewide level that uh, that may poach on our uh, online education programs. And so we'll have to see how that works out. Uh, as well, but uh, uh, I think we're up to the challenges. I think that uh, that uh, uh, we're working hard, and uh, I, uh, I I think that uh, uh, that I'm optimistic about how we're doing, what the future is. That's all. Thank you, Trustee Otto. Um, I have a few things to report on. I just um, wanted to um, echo everyone's. Uh, uh, support and sentiment of College Day. It was amazing. It was the best College Day I've ever been to. So thank you, all of you, for the hard work you did. Um, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, wow, wow. It was amazing. Um, the helicopters, the police officers, everybody had it. Uh, was in on it. I loved it. Our faculty, our classified staff, our uh, community members. Were there community members? I guess uh, students count as community members. Oh yeah, Dr. R our Mayor Robert Garcia and of course our um, trustees. I'm sorry uh, that I was your sole boring uh, trustee that did not participate um, and uh, I'm just uh, a little bit shy when it comes to these things. So um, I, you guys represented very well um, and I really appreciated all that you did that day. Um, it was so inspiring to see you bring your grade, your uh, board, about what, how, how she, for those of you who weren't there, she started her speech with showing uh, the uh, uh, little scorecard of a student, an F student, and um, just walked it through on how it was just a victory over the past and how transformative it was, and that report card was um, the superintendent presidents uh, and how counselors and guided pathways and all the support systems that we have that um, uh, could be available to our students that are available to our students could help our students you know take that leap to the next level and be successful and I really appreciated you being so great and making yourself vulnerable and sharing that it was amazing that's why you're so relatable and our students love you or our entire campus community loves you and we love you um, I also wanted to mention that um, as the superintendent president Dr. Romali mentioned um, we had the um, uh, Maritime Center of Excellence that the Port of Long Beach um, supported. It's going to help our students. We reported on it last time around, um, but uh, we also have a new industry partner. It's our first industry partner, and that's the Port of Long Beach for the College Promise. So hopefully on uh, in the near future, September 26th, I believe, as you mentioned, um, we're going to unveil this effort, which is going to, going to be our Promise 2.0, and I'm very much looking forward to it. And building on our community partnerships, 
Um, on September 5th and 6th, we had the opening of our welcome centers for our students, so that was amazing. I had the great privilege um, to stand uh, besides my colleagues, uh, Trustee Intuk and Trustee Otto, um, while I unsuccessfully cut the ribbon the, uh, with the scissor that I swear it wasn't operator error. It uh, just, the, but the next day, lo and behold, the scissor was sharpened, so thank you. Um, it was pretty clunky on my part, but it was great. Um, that's the, the least of our worries. Uh, the center itself was just amazing. Um, the counselors were uh, in uh, working as we went and visited. It was just wonderful. I'm very much looking forward to it. I want to really acknowledge you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali, our faculty, counselors, uh, staff that had so much to do with this. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and um, it's just great that you executed. They say ideas are free, but execution is priceless, and um, I love seeing that uh, be put in motion. So that our students, I mean, I get lost when I come to campus. It's like a university campus. You can easily get, um, you know, lost, and um, I'm, I can be rather a wanderer. Um, so having somewhere to go to and have uh, guidance was amazing to see, and I really uh, applaud you. Afterwards, we, on September 6th, we had the opportunity, and this is another idea that executed was executed by our great superintendent president. We have these hygiene packs that... I asked her to look into and see if we can um, uh, make for our homeless students along with um, some uh, care products and you know some things that would help like a USB um, uh, stick so it'll help them with their school board uh, school uh, work and we stuffed them we took some photos it may come in the um, material near you soon, but um, I just really am grateful for the work that you guys are doing for our students. I want to put it out there that our students should know they can go to the Student Health Center, and uh, these uh, resources are available to them, food pantry and also hygiene packs, and we're go going to get um, uh, boxes and boxes of uh, non-perishable food coming from multiple sources um, soon, and we're going to be doing food drives. Um, and, um, of course, our task force that you heard earlier with our foundation representatives um, who uh, sit on the task force, we're, they're working on a more long-term endeavor and effort. And hopefully with this $30 million that we're going to get in the bond money, we can perhaps look at housing options for our most needy and underserved um, students who are dealing with housing instability. That uh, should be a long-term goal if it's the will of the board. Um, with that, I believe I've said enough. Um, we are going to move on to the next item, 7.4, board travel. This is a new um, agenda item that we've added and is going to be uh, reported on with the trustees travel as they um, uh, make those trips um, subsequently, and we will see that sunshine in our reporting. Trustee committees, I don't have any committees for, that we need to report on. Um, uh, item 8.1 um, is the uh, request for an agenda item, um, for future agenda items or reports, uh, and this is only with the consensus of the board. We do have a request from Trustee Intuk that I want to, um, he has been uh, uh, diligent enough to write his request and sign it. Um, uh, he, I'm going to read his uh, statement. He's, he, I would like to request an agenda item for our October 16, 2018 board meeting. Um, I request the superintendent president, Dr. Romali, and associated LBCC staff to work with the city of Long Beach, city manager, economic development department, and Pacific Gateway Workforce Inf Investment Network to evaluate partnering with Long Beach City College and exploring opportunities and feasibility of establishing a center in North Long Beach focused on the following issues, educational access, economic inclusion, workforce development, job training, and higher education outreach. Uh, his request that we prepare, that staff prepare a presentation for October's meeting and um, on the college's criteria and recommendation to continue exploring the feasibility of, a, of such a center with multiple options for the Board of Trustees to consider. So I want to put that out there to the rest of the board, see if you are in agreement with having this come before us um, to discuss and um, consider um, what is uh, feasible. 
uh, it is my understanding that the city is paying for this feasibility study and it will not have a fiscal impact from what I have been told. Is it the will of the board to consider this item for October or perhaps the subsequent uh, meeting uh, November? I it, it, trust you, Otto. Yeah, it's, it's fine with me, although I can't imagine it being ready in October um, with everything that's going on. And so if we could keep the date fluid and let uh, the college work with the city, uh, I'm willing to consider uh, any of that, and, uh, and 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 by the way, I'm not sure what the date of the board be. So I thought it was a 22nd or 23rd or something like that. But uh, but uh, <coughs> I, I, I'm happy to to uh, explore this. Okay. Uh, Vice President Malauulu, do you, are you comfortable? Yeah. You're okay. Okay. All right. I I agree, uh, Trustee Otto. Um, you're right that we. Um, we don't necessarily know if it's going to be ready. It's my understanding that October, uh, the city is considering the feasibility study, and um, um, if we wanted to go this route, we just need to indicate it to them that we'd like them to include us in their in their fe feasibility study. I think that's the impetus for the request. But I agree with you. We can't really forecast when this will actually the data will be available. So um, we'll keep it open as far as the timeline. Okay, um, President. Superintendent President, Dr. Romali. A little bit of input on that. Okay. Uh, with, as your pleasure, I don't think it would be any harm for us to go ahead and tell the city, let's go ahead and be included in the study. In the meantime, um, I will be absent from the October meeting. Dr. Kathy Scott will be sitting in my place. The team that would work on this has a, um, an urgent matter that they are attending to until September 30th mm -hmm. and would be able to give their full attention October 1st. So it may be done by the October meeting. It might be done by November. Uh, I just want to let you know that for the next three weeks, I've got them on another item, but I want to give this their full sure. attention after that. I think that's a gr yeah, that, that's your pleasure. That sounds um, prudent, and uh, we'll do that. We are our, our own um, autonomous uh, body, and we set our uh, timelines and it shouldn't necessarily be based on a, another jurisdiction's timelines. So I agree with you. Um, my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I don't want this to take away from anyone's um, focus, uh, primary focus. Did, Jackie, did you have a uh, uh, secretary? Right. That's, that's fine. I'll, um, you don't have to remember how to <laughs> all the... Uh, Pertinent points there, I'll give you his write-up. Okay, we're gonna move on to public comments um, on non-agenda items. A total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. I don't have any board, um, any requests uh, for public comment. We don't have a second closed session item 10.1 and we will go ahead and adjourn the meeting to October 23rd at the Liberal Arts Campus, building T room 1100. Closed session is at 4 p.m. and open session is at 5 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>